The Committee on Oversight and Government Reform will come to order. A quorum being present, we will begin. We will be rolling votes today based on agreement with other committees that are also holding markups. Today we meet to consider H.R. 829, the Contracting and Tax Accountability Act of 2011, H.R. 828, the Federal Employee Tax Accountability Act of 2011, H.R. 1470, a bill to extend the probationary period for Federal employees, and H.R. 1423, a bill to designate a facility of the United States Post Office located at 1154, oh, sorry, 115 4th Avenue Southwest in uh, Ad Ard Ard Ardmore, Oklahoma, to Specialist Michael E. Phillips Post Office. Pursuant to Committee Rule 6, I discharge the Subcommittee on the Federal Workforce and the Subcommittee on Technology Information Policy and Procurement Reform from consideration of H.R. 828 and H.R. 829. The Committee will now consider H.R. 829, the Contracting and Tax Accountability Act of 2011. I commend Congressman Chaffetz for introducing this bill. The millions of Americans who filed their taxes this week know the IRS will hold them accountable. Contractors and grantees who failed to fulfill their tax obligations at some point must be held accountable. For contractors and grantees, accountability means not getting a contract or grant if they do not and will not pay their taxes. The measure prohibits the awarding of a contract or grant unless a prospective contractor or grantee certifies to the agency making the award that they have no seriously delinquent tax debts. And I might note for the record, seriously delinquent tax debt is really the final, final, final point of frustration of the IRS. The GAO has shown that thousands of Federal contractors and grantees have had substantial amounts of Federal taxes in 2007 alone. The GAO found that 27 DOD contractors and 33,000 civilian agency contractors and 3,800 GSA contractors owed a total of $7.7 billion in unpaid taxes. GAO also showed that almost 6 percent of Federal grantees dodged their taxes. I will also note for the record, these numbers are based on those who had not paid their taxes, and only a sm subset, a small subset, are those who are not making arrangements or in some other way willing to pay their taxes. The Chair now recognizes the uh, gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Cummings, for his opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And H.R. 829 is identical to a bill introduced in the last Congress by Representatives Ellsworth and former Chairman Towns, and is very uh, similar to legislation which was reported by this committee and subsequently passed in the House in the 110th Congress. I supported this legislation then and I support it today. The Government Account <coughs> Accountability Office has reported that government contractors owed more than $5 billion, that is with a B, $5 billion in unpaid Federal taxes in 2004 and 2005. Unpaid taxes owed by contractors included payroll taxes, such as amounts required to be withheld from employee wages, as well as uh, corporate income taxes. Further, the GAO has found that some of the contractors with unpaid tax debts are repeat offenders that have failed to pay their taxes over many, many years. In fact, for almost 20 years in at least one case. H.R. 829 will allow the Federal Government to make sure that the contractors seeking to do business with it have paid their taxes before they can receive a Federal contract. I note that the Federal Acquisition Regulation was revised in 2008 to require contractors to certify that they do not owe a delinquent tax debt to the Federal Government. The bill requires, uh, on, on, requires that the bill, the bills the bill builds on that requirement by providing Federal agencies the means to verify contractors' claims. 
The legislation will also ensure that responsible contractors no longer co have to compete with tax delinquents. I urge members to support this uh, legislation to ensure that in this time of fiscal austerity, we can make certain that taxpayer dollars are not given to companies that do not pay what they owe to the taxpayers. And with that, I yield back the balance of my time. I thank the Ranking Member for his comments and his support. I will hold the record open until the end of the day for any members who would like to submit written statements. We will now, we will now open the bill, H.R. 829, for consideration. Without objection, H.R. 829 will be considered as read and open for amendment at any time. The text has already been distributed to, into each of your folders. The clerk will designate the bill. H.R. 829, a bill to prohibit the awarding of a contract or grant in excess of the simplified acquisition threshold unless the prospective contractor or grantee certifies in writing to the agency awarding the contract or grant that the contractor or grantee has no seriously delinquent tax debts and for other purposes. Thank you. The gentleman from Utah has an amendment in the nature of a sub substitute. The amendment has been distributed. Without objection, the amendment shall be considered as read and original text for the purpose of amendment. Mr. Chaffetz is recognized to explain his amendment in the form of a substitute. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, Sam Walton, one of, my, uh, one of my favorites, founder of Walmart, he had a great saying. He said, all my best ideas I got from someone else. Uh, I want to thank the people that have uh, fought for this bill in the past. Uh, this has passed in the 110th Congress uh, through the House of Representatives. Uh, the sponsor in the Senate was then, Senate, uh, was then Senator Barack Obama. Uh, but I would also like to rec uh, recognize and, and thank uh, our former colleague, Mr. Ellsworth, who uh, sponsored and championed this and helped push it through in the 110th Congress. Nevertheless, this business is unfinished because it did not pass in the Senate. Uh, did not uh, get uh, put into law. Uh, yet I know that President Obama is very supportive of this, uh, this uh, type of legislation. I can't say that he endorses this specific piece of legislation. But on uh, January 20 um, of uh, 2010, uh, the President uh, issued a statement uh, supporting this type of legislation. He's obviously been supportive of it in the past. I think we can do this in a very bipartisan way. As the Chairman uh, mentioned, I would like to highlight some of the stats because I think the numbers are absolutely, absolutely stunning. And we are basing this in, on the GAO study that was uh, released on April, 7, uh, April 19, 2007. Thousands of Federal Contractors Abused the Federal Tax System is the name of that report. GAO has shown that thousands of Federal contractors had substantial amounts of unpaid Federal taxes. In 2007 alone, the GAO found that 27 1,000, 27,000 Department of Defense contractors, 33,000 civilian agency contractors, and 3,800 GSA contractors owed more than $7.7 .7 billion in unpaid taxes. This is money that is already due to the American people and yet is not being paid. For grantees, the numbers are also high. One GAO report demonstrated that tens of thousands of grantees collectively owed $790 million in Federal taxes in 2006 alone. This included over 2,000 individuals and organizations that received $124 billion of payments directly from the Federal Government and who owed more than $270 million in unpaid taxes. This represented almost 6 percent of the recipients that fell into this tax category. This bill denies tax delinquent contractors from receiving new contracts at the beginning of the bidding process by de deny denying them status as a, quote, presently responsible contractor, end quote, if they are delinquent with their taxes. A company or individual is not allowed to bid on a government business unless they are first determined to be presently responsible. The bill also defines, quote, serious delinquent tax debt, end quote, as an outstanding debt tax for which notice of lien has been filed in public records, while providing exceptions for debts being paid in a timely manner and debts in which a due process hearing has been requested or is pending. If they are trying to do the right thing, if they are trying to get right with the IRS, if they are trying to get right with their, uh, making their payments, this isn't going to affect them. But for those that are going to scurry the law, those that are going to be pushing this aside, it does address this. I would like to read uh, an excerpt of what uh, President Obama said um, in, in, 2000 time, in 2010. 
Quote, all across the country there are people who meet their obligations each and every day. You do your jobs, you support your families, you pay your taxes, you owe, because it is a fundamental responsibility of citizenship. And yet, somehow, it has become standard practice in Washington to give contracts to companies that don't pay their taxes. Later on, he went on to say, in a time of great need, when our families and our nation are finding it necessary to tighten our belts, to be more responsible in how we spend our money, we can't afford to waste taxpayer dollars, and we especially can't afford to let companies game the system. We need to make sure that every tax dollar we spend is going to address our nation's urgent needs and to make a difference in the lives of people. The status quo, then, is inefficient and it is wasteful. But the larger and more fundamental point is that it is wrong. It is simply wrong for companies to take taxpayer dollars and not be taxpayers themselves. So we need to insist on the same sense of responsibility in Washington that so many of you strive to uphold in your lives, in your in your own families and in your own businesses. I encourage my, member, the, my colleagues uh, to support this piece of legislation. I think we can do so in a bipartisan way and make sure that the responsible contractors, the people that are paying their taxes, are those that are given preference and that actually are rewarded with contracts in the future. I yield back the balance of my time. I thank the gentleman. Does anyone else? Uh, miss the ranking member is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, this amendment makes uh, certain technical and clarifying changes to the bill. I commend you and Mr. Chaffetz for working with the minority in a bipartisan manner to, on this amendment, and I urge the members to support it. With that, I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Uh, seeing no one, uh, Mr. Connolly was next. Thank five you, minutes. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, uh, I have uh, an amendment at the desk. Uh, we are not open for amendments with, uh, yet. We, ah. will, we will as soon as everyone gets their openings. I will Mr. withhold. Okay. Mr. Lynch? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I am generally supportive of, of the gentleman's legislation. I do want to raise one, one uh, just area of concern. Uh, the, the gentleman, the chairman has, has indicated this. We, we are looking at the final, final point of frustration for the IRS. Uh, that may be our, our intent, but, but that is not the way this, this bill reads. And uh, I am concerned that, look, the IRS is going to have to be more and more aggressive because of the position we are in financially. And he here is my concern. Uh, a lien can arise for a number of reasons against a contractor. And, look, I am not at all trying to protect those folks that you are you, describing the ones that are, are uh, just scoff laws and are, are, are tax avoiders. But if, if, a, if, a, if a lien arises uh, because of a determination uh, regarding a, a business uh, that, a, that a trust is not uh, entitled to uh, certain tax treatment, once that determination comes out, that tax liability will arise from a decision by, by a tax court, for, for example, or a determined simply by the IRS without a, 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 a due process hearing. And so the lien, uh, in many cases, is the IRS's way of saying, look, we are going to put a lien on this. We are not sure how much you owe or whether you owe, but we are going to put a lien on you to make sure if we do win, we can collect. And, and that is how the lien is used. Now, what we are saying is that lien, that lien will automatically put this uh, contractor in a with the government. Would the gentleman yield? Uh, just, just let me finish my thought and I will be happy to yield. Uh, here is the problem. It says that we are going to put the lien on and disqualify the contractor before, before we have a due process hearing. That is a problem. That is a problem because you are saying we are going to make a determination, we are going to, we are, we are going to put a lien on your property before you get to dispute the IRS claim that you owe us money. And while, look, if, if you are talking about the bad guys, I think we can all agree. But also, I think this, this casts a wider net that you're actually, you may be catching good contractors doing the right thing in, in this net by, by disqualifying them just because the IRS happens to put a lien to, to preserve their right to collect at a later date. That, that's my concern, and I, and I yield to the Chairman. I, I thank the gentleman. Uh, we believe, 
and are willing to either accept amendments or certainly to put into report language, and we plan on putting in report language, that the practice today is, as the gentleman says, that liens are often put on well below, before the appeal process even begins and certainly before it ends. As a result, the term seriously delinquent in this bill is, we believe from the IRS and we, we believe in the report language, will be clearly understood to be upon the conclusion of all appeals. So long as there is a dispute that is underway under the administrative process or even taken to Federal court if someone takes leave to do that, they would not by definition be seriously delinquent. Seriously delinquent is when the process has completed or they have defaulted on uh, that process. That would be the only point at which someone under each of the bills would be seriously delinquent. And I would be happy to work with the gentleman. I know Mr. Chaffetz would be happy to work with him on specific report language so that that is absolutely clear. Uh, this was something that came up on both bills in the last Congress. We take seriously that out of that $7.7 .7 billion, we are only looking for those who at the end of the trail, including uh, post-garnishment, have no intention on paying. And, and that's a very small subset. I yield back. May, I, yield. May, I, may I, I, I ask you to ask that the gentleman would give an additional minute? Thank, thank, you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. The, the problem is I don't see that language in the bill. I don't see that language in the definition of seriously delinquent. It has a bunch of exceptions. It does not indicate that the, that the appeal process has been exhausted. It does not indicate that there is there's any, uh, any, any process here. Uh, for appeal, it just has a blank statement, what is seriously delinquent and the consequences of that. So uh, with all due respect to the gentleman, I, I know what your intent is verbally, but I don't see that reflected in, in the legislation. I yield back. Yield. Thank you. I would like to yield to uh, Mr. Tierney. Uh, I would just like to second that only. I think we have a, uh, an unfortunate history of passing some vague language in statutes sometimes, and we leave it for either agencies or bootstrapping in by definition. I think it would serve us well if we can work together on this uh, with Mr. Chaffetz and with you, Mr. Chairman, to put the language actually in the legislation itself. It sounds like we are all in agreement as to the intent. It ought not to be an uh, overwhelming drafting job, and I think it would be uh, to everyone's benefit to do that. Thank you. I thank the gentleman. Before I recognize Mr. Lankford, uh, I would ask that all members note on the bill, uh, the amendment actually, uh, on page 7, beginning at line 13, for the exception which includes relief under subsection uh, 6015. I, I believe that is the language that either is sufficient or would need to be amended. And I would just note for all of those as we go through this process to reference that. Mr. Langford. Yes, I would like to yield my time to uh, the gentleman from Utah, Mr. Chaffetz. Um, to address the, the gentleman's concern, I, again, I, I would draw to page 7 under exceptions, because clearly it is not the intent of somebody to dismiss somebody or not allow them to bid on something uh, if they are still going through that adjudication process. So there, clearly we tried to delineate two exceptions. Debt is being paid in a timely manner. That is, that it comes to some sort of agreement. They have got some sort of uh, payment plan in place, somebody who is trying to do the right thing. Uh, the second part of that, number two, quote, a debt with respect to which a collection due process hearing under section, and it goes on, is requested or pending. So that clearly, if a lien is placed, that company or contractor or grantee is given an option, an opportunity to say, wait a sec, wait a sec, wait a sec, I want to have a hearing. I want to get, I need, I need this to be further clarified. Under this law, the way it is currently written, that paragraph says if it is requested or it is pending, because clearly you can say, hey, I would like a hearing, and it may take a couple of months to get to that point, then that provides that exception. Conceptually, I think I agree with most of what, to, of what you are saying. I happen to think that this paragraph deals with this sufficiently, but if you have an amendment or an adjustment to that, I have tried to be as crystal clear as we can possibly be. I, I would appreciate if the gentleman would consider that paragraph as being um, uh, sufficient and in compliance and, and consistent with, uh, with the intent of what you are drawing. I will yield was back. Gentleman, to would the gentleman yield? It is Mr. Langford's time. Oh, I am time, sorry. I am yes. sorry. That is correct. I am sorry. Yes, I would. Oh, thank you, sir. Uh, the, the, the problem is that uh, in, in many cases, a lien is put against property uh, through, through a filing process. And so uh, there may not be 
actual notice to the individual uh, contractor. So their ability to know and to file an appeal would be inhibited under those circumstances. Uh, so that, that, that if, creates a real problem. And, and, I, and I know this just from, the, you know, my practice of law, uh, that, you know, oftentimes the, the, uh, the leaning agency or entity, if you will, doesn't have the ability to, to provide actual notice to the person or to the corporation. And so we just, we, we go ahead and we lean the property because eventually, eventually, if that person tries to sell the property or, 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 or tries to transfer it, that lien is a, is a notice on that property that a claim has been made. And it's at that point, it may be years later when that person tries to sell that property, they find out there's a lien on their property, and uh, a, a tax lien, and they need to clear that up. Uh, and that's the, that's the point at which they really have actual notice. So there, as you envision it, there would be actual notice and the person would be slugging it out. And I agree with you. Under those circumstances, you're absolutely correct. But uh, it doesn't, this doesn't address uh, a, a large portion of how, how this actually plays out in practice. I reclaim my time and I with, with yield the, back. With the gentleman, I, I think the gentleman. The gentleman yield. The gentleman I do yield. yield. We, we had testimony uh, in the 111th Congress, um, and we had uh, Ms. Tucker, who is the Wage and Investment Deputy Commissioner for Support at the Internal Rev Revenue Service, come testify to our committee, that which uh, you and I were both attending. Um, it, based on her testimony, this is at a minimum a four-and-a-half or five-month process of which multiple notifications are given to this, in this case, contractor, um, so that there is this back and forth and this notification. Um, she went on further to testify that that process can be extended out much longer than four and a half to five months. Now, certainly, if you take a larger organization, you may have some tax lien that's suddenly found in some other, you know, oblivion, you know, it's somewhere out there that they weren't they weren't aware of. The spirit of what we are doing, and I think the letter of what we are doing, says that if, it, if they make whole on it, then they clear up this problem immediately. And if they are seeking a hearing, whether it is requested or pending, they would be exempted from being uh, uh, excluded from uh, uh, filing for a contract. With that, I will yield back. With that, I yield back to the Chairman. Does anyone else seek time? Does any member wish to offer an amendment? The gentleman from Virginia is recognized to offer his amendment. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment offered by Mr. Connolly of Virginia to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 829, page 2, line 17, insert and subject to paragraph 3 before the comma. Page 2, line 18, insert suspension or before debarment. Page 3, after line 7, insert the following. 3, determination by Secretary of the Treasury. A suspension or debarment may be proposed under paragraph 1 with respect to any seriously delinquent tax debt only after the Secretary of the Treasury or his designee makes a de determination that such debt cannot be collected pursuant to a levy under Section 6331H of the Internal Revenue Code of 1986. Mr. Chairman, I certainly agree that the Federal Government needs to make sure that uh, we don't tolerate underpayment of taxes from Federal contractors, uh, and that is why I filed this amendment. This, I hope, friendly amendment would help implement the Treasury Inspector General's recommendations to improve the Federal Levy Collection Program which is the means by which the Treasury recoups taxes, back taxes, from contractors. It requires that Treasury use the levy first to recover back taxes, protecting the taxpayers' interests before moving to suspension or debarment of Federal contractors. This structure also ensures that a small business contractor who may not even be aware yet that she or he was behind in his or her taxes has a chance to catch up before being debarred summarily. As you can imagine, this would not be an issue for the very large contractors and their teams of lawyers, but could be a very real concern for small and minority-owned business contractors, such as uh, recently returned veterans. I believe the Common Sense Amendment would improve the functionality of H.R. 829, and I would hope Mr. Chaffetz, the uh, author of the uh, bill, would accept it as a friendly amendment. 
And I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Does anyone else seek recognition on this amendment? Uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chaffetz is recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Um, I, I appreciate the gentleman's, uh, gentleman's amendment. Uh, I am just trying to understand if this is truly what we are trying to incentivize in getting involved with, uh, you know, should we not be, you know, should we be providing contracts or grants to company if the only way we can collect taxes they owe is to levy levy Federal payments to them, um, you know, are these the people that we are really trying to do business with? I, I guess I have a conceptual vision that the people that do play by the rules, the people that are paying their taxes, the people that are doing the right things, this is who we should be giving preference to. I think that is a fair and just, reasonable way to approach this. Um, and I worry that this amendment would actually Take it a step in the opposite direction. It, 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 and I would be happy to yield to the gentleman to, to try to further clarify that point for me, but I guess that is the, that's the concern that I have in, in terms of this, uh, this amendment. Yes, uh, if my friend would yield. Yes. Um, I thank him. Uh, I, again, I, I think uh, I, I understand the intent of his legislation and I am not unsympathetic, but I can tell you, as somebody who worked for 20 years as a Federal contractor, uh, things can go wrong that are not the fault of the contractor. Uh, remember that most contractors are small and minority-owned businesses. They are not big, the big guys. Uh, they don't have bevies of lawyers to protect them uh, in terms of tax accountants and so forth. And it is, as my friends from Massachusetts both pointed out, with the best of intentions, due process can be violated. Is there anyone in this room who is not aware of a, an example where the IRS perhaps has made a mistake? or has acted hastily before uh, the full facts are known. It is quite possible a small minority-owned, female-owned, veterans-owned business could find their, their in delinquency without, uh, after the fact. And I am concerned that the legislation in front of us needs to have some flexibility. And after all, the intent here isn't punitive. The intent is to collect the taxes owed to the taxpayer of the United States. And so we want to give people an opportunity to come into compliance, especially those tens of thousands of small, small contractors uh, who often may not be aware of the fact that, in fact, they are delinquent. And I just want to give them one more step before the ultimate nuclear weapon is triggered, which is suspension of debarment. I yield back to my friend. Re reclaiming my time. Um, I appreciate those comments and, and that, in that approach. I, I happen to disagree. I am not trying to go nuclear, <laughs> so to speak, uh, on companies. Uh, but we have a serious problem, a multi-billion, billion-dollar pro problem here. Um, and I think uh, we have adequately and sufficiently allowed through the process in the adjudication process. And if there are separate hearings or legislation that needs to address how the IRS does business and, and the manner in which they do business, then uh, I would be happy to work with the gentleman on, on that piece of legislation. But we are bending over backwards saying, even if you request a hearing, we are not going to kick this in. That, I think, is sufficient. And uh, consequently, I would uh, recommend that we uh, the oppose this amendment. Would the gentleman yield? Yes. Please. Uh, uh, placing attention on page 7, line 9, when it says, any debt that is being paid in the timely manner pursuant to an agreement under, and it gives the sections, wouldn't that cover anybody who got to the end of the time and entered into uh, a lien with a, a payment schedule? Uh, reclaiming my time, absolutely. That's, that's the way I read it. That's my intention. I think that's the way it's been drafted. If this, somebody is on a payment plan, if somebody says, all right, we owe this $25,000 and, and whatever agreement they come up with the IRS and they are going to pay you know, $2,000 a month to get whole, um, that makes sense. They are trying to do the right thing. And that is the spirit in which it is offered. So yield back the balance of my time. Mr. Chairman. 
Okay. Uh, Chair recognizes the gentleman from uh, Maryland for five minutes. Thank you very much. I want to, um, to Mr. the sponsor of the amendment, Ms. Connolly. Um, the colloquy that just took place, I am just wondering what your response is to that, because uh, I want you, I want us to be real clear. Um, does so you have the opinion that the language that was just cited on page seven about debt being paid in a timely manner uh, would not address the issue that you are concerned about? Um, if, if the I gentleman, yield to the gentleman. I thank my colleague and the ranking member. Uh, as my colleagues from Massachusetts pointed out, uh, Mr. Cummings, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, this is a, a big subject, and people may owe taxes without fully knowing that delinquent. Uh, and I am concerned that, uh, the, with the best of intentions, the bill in front of us, frankly, is too rigid a standard, and the axe will fall on really innocent parties. Uh, the IRS record, uh, in terms of due process, is a spotty one at best. In fact, ironically, it is my friends, especially on the other side of the aisle, who have often correctly pointed that out. Uh, well, they, they can be just as injudicious or, or wrongheaded in dealing with contractors as they can with individual taxpayers. And so I am trying to make sure there is one more step before that act of debarment and suspension falls. Um, I believe if we were to adopt my kind of amendment, it would give us the flexibility in implementing this bill. Uh, the intent would be kept uh, a whole, but would be showing a little bit more flexibility, especially to those small and minority-owned and veterans-owned contractors who don't have the sophisticated machinery all the time uh, to, to fully understand uh, that they may, in fact, not be in compliance with tax code at, a, at any given moment, and it is not willful. And that is my concern. Thank you very much. I yield back to the ranking member. I don't think I got my four or five minutes, but if, if the gentleman okay, needs more yeah, time, please yes, take it. Yes, please. I just want to, can you give, so for the committee's clarification, I just want you to give an example of a situation where um, a debt cannot be collected pursuant to a levy. I mean, I just, just for, for clarification's sake, I am just trying to, in other words, I am going back to the amendment itself. And what kind of situation would you see where a debt could not be uh, collected uh, pursuant to a levy? I yield to the gentleman just for that response. Thank you, Mr. Well, uh, I mean, if I understand the gentleman's question, obviously a truly recalcitrant uh, uh, delinquent uh, would fall into that category. I just, uh, I just wanted to just get some clarification for the committee, and I, and I yield back. Does anyone else seek time? Uh, the gentleman uh, from Oklahoma. I do. I have a clarification on this as well. And um, I thank the gentleman for offering the amendment, engaging in the tone. And we work together in the committee together as a ranking member. And uh, for his attitude and tone there is very, very respectful. And thank you for that. Uh, as I am reading through this, with respect to any seriously delinquent tax uh, debt, obviously deals with someone that this is not a first time accidental type occurrence. This is a building seriously delinquent ongoing. Obviously, it cannot be collected already through levy because it has been attempted to be collected by levy already at that point. That is my confusion to say if, if it is determined to be seriously delinquent, we have already done a levy. Uh, it is apparent at that point that we cannot collect it. Either there is no contact there or they have not responded or they are unable to collect it. So I am a little confused on how this all works, uh, the, the Treasury Department basically looking at something and saying, yes, it is seriously delinquent. Uh, we have tried a levy. That is not working. Uh, that is appropriate. So I am a little confused on why this is necessary based on this. I, I think I understand your intent. It is the wording of it that I look at and I think, I think it is not accomplishing what you are saying it is accomplishing. And with that, I would love to be able to yield to you. Um, I would say to my friend that I have tried to lay out that I, I believe what is in front of us. I mean, this bill, the intent of which I certainly support, I will not be able to support because I think it is too rigid. I think that it is going to cast a wide net and that it is going to collect a lot of innocent parties or unwitting parties. And all of us in this Congress have complained at one time or another about the arbitrariness, frankly, of the IRS and its methodology in collecting taxes and then sometimes pronouncing someone guilty when, in fact, they are innocent. 
Uh, and, and I really hearken back to the words of both Mr. Tierney and Mr. Lynch. It happens. And it is in an abundance of concern that I want to make sure we bend over backwards to show the people we are talking about that we are prepared to be fair and give them every opportunity uh, to make sure they are right with the Lord. And, uh, and that is the sole intent of this, this amendment. It would raise the threshold, I, I agree, in terms of when suspension or debarment occurs, uh, but I think that is appropriate uh, when we are talking. I mean, it is a very significant thing when you decide to suspend or debar a contractor from doing business with the Federal Government. In many cases, especially if you are a small and minority-owned, female-owned or veteran-owned business, that could be the end of, of life as you know it. I mean, you, you go out of business. Um, and so I am concerned about due process and fair treatment and bending over backwards to give everyone one last chance before that act falls. Will, will the gentleman, gentleman Neal? I would. W with that said, I am wondering if, Mr. Conley, if we accepted this amendment, if you would support the bill? If you accepted this amendment, I would support the bill, Mr. Chaffetz. I appreciate that. I am nothing, nothing if not consistent, Mr. Chaffetz. <laughs> yield back my time. And with that, I would yield back as well. Does anyone else seek recognition on the amendment? Mr. Chairman? Yes, if, if I would. Uh, there is one thing I, I just want to recognize for five minutes. Thank you, sir. Uh, I, I just want to make sure people understand the, this whole appeal process and uh, the, the institution of the lien and, and how that all works. Uh, we seem to think that the casting of the lien and then an appeal, a, a series of appeals, uh, somehow fleshes out whether this is a meaningful uh, uh, or, or a, uh, a proper lien against property or not. I just want to remind people that uh, the IRS institutes the lien against the taxpayer. Your first appeal is to appeal to the IRS to reverse their decision. You are not appealing to a, an independent third party. You are saying to the IRS, I think you made the wrong decision here, and I am appealing, uh, appealing to you to agree with that. Your second appeal will be back to the IRS as well. They'll, they'll, so they are going to sit there and say, well, let me think about this. Did I make the right decision or the wrong decision? Of course, they are going to side with themselves. That is not a meaningful appeal. Now, the word adjudicated has been used by the gentleman from Utah a couple of times. That is not an adjudication. When you go back to the person who made the original decision and ask them to change it, that is not an adjudication. That is not a, an independent third party that is actually going to weigh the arguments. It is it's their argument. They are they're ruling on their own decision. In the vast majority of cases, <laughs> they are going to agree with their own original decision. They are not going to side with their, the, the adversary, obviously. So, and and that, all happens, that all happens, you know, before uh, there, there's actually a, a, an adjudication of, of the case. So, you know, I, I understand there are appeal rights here, but it's appeal back to the IRS to ask them to reverse their decision. And again, given the aggressive, the necessarily aggressive posture of the IRS going forward, uh, taxpayers are going to be in a pretty tough position if they if they think they're going to get the IRS to change their own decision. So it, it is an appeal, but in my opinion, it is not a meaningful appeal. And would, I, yield, I yield back. Would the would gentleman yield? yield? Sure. Uh, I might remind the gentleman we don't have jurisdiction over the IRS. However, there is a conundrum here, which is that if someone has abandoned their appeals and they don't want to be debarred, the IRS is still going to go forward and take such assets as are necessary to make the U.S. government whole. So although we can't stop the IRS from, in your opinion, being uh, one-sided and so on, and that may be true, I, I would say to the gentleman, one of the challenges we have is, of course, that we are only looking at whether somebody has abandoned their rights to continue the appeal and still wants to be a contractor. We are not looking at the fact that a contractor is pretty crippled if they can't and won't pay the amount, and yet it is being taken from them not subject to an agreement. And that's, I think that is part of what Mr. Chaffetz is seeking here, is to realize that really bad contractors include those who cannot or will not enter a new agreement with the IRS, knowing that the IRS, as you said, 
ultimately is a one-way street. If you, if you walk away and you become seriously delinquent, they will seize assets, which begs the question of whether you are going to be an effective contractor. Well, well the gentleman, uh, well, we are reclaiming my own time. Uh, we have to. We are lawmakers, and we can influence what the IRS does. That's what, that's what we're about right here. Uh, we have to draft law uh, without presupposing whether that individual taxpayer is is guilty or innocent. So what we're doing here is we're trying to protect their rights. We're trying to protect their rights, whether you know, no matter who they are, these taxpayers. If you allow the IRS to wear a taxpayer down, the first appeal, the second appeal, the third appeal, before they get an independent adjudication of their rights, then, then those rights aren't really uh, being exercised. The IRS can beat down the taxpayer to the point where they just have to give up, either relinquish the property that is being leaned or give up their rights and, and, and be debarred. Th those are pretty hard choices. And that is all, under your legislation, that is all before it is adjudicated. So that is a, that's a, that's a hard place to leave the taxpayer. And, and I am assuming that some of the, the taxpayers are, are, are innocent and, and, and they have got, got valid rights that need to be protected. I am not talking about, you know, you keep talking about, uh, you know, the bad guys, the scoff laws, the recalcitrant uh, individuals. All I am saying, there are also good people out there trying to do the right thing that get, that get caught on that net as well. I yield back. Thank you. Thank you. The gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Jordan. For thank you, minutes. Mr. Chairman. I would like to yield to the gentleman from uh, Utah. Uh, thank you. Um, I would like to address this uh, amendment by, offered by Mr. Conley. And, and I want to run through a case scenario, uh, Mr. Conley, if, and if, if you can help me understand this. I, we worry about those that are going to game the system. And if you look at page 6, and you may not have this GAO report in front of you, but the GAO report was very clear in taking a major section of their report. It says, and I am going to read part of it, our investigator, investigations also revealed that some owners or officers in our, of our case study, federal contractors with unpaid taxes, were associated with other businesses that had unpaid federal taxes. For example, we reported that one of our cases, a, a case study, contractors, had a 20-year history of opening a business, failing to remit taxes withheld from employees to the IRS, and then closing the business only to start the cycle all over again, incur more tax debt, and almost immediately through a new business. Now, the concern that I have with your amendment is that if you say, well, we can simply gather this, these uncollected taxes through a levy, that to me is a, you're going to have unscrupulous business owners who say, ah, it's just a way to refinance things. Ah, oh, we just refinance it. They can't, they can't do anything to me. I got the contract. I was the lowest bidder. I can get my profit margin because I don't have to pay taxes. And the law now says, based on your amendment, ah, they, can, they can't do anything. All they can do is levy it. And so it, we want people to play by the rules. And what this GAO report is saying, there are $7.7 .7 billion in uncollected taxes because people are gaming the system. Now, we are going to review a bill uh, shortly after this one that deals with Federal taxpayers not collecting, not, not paying their taxes. What is interesting here is that the IRS was given more stringent rules with their own employees, and consequently they have the highest compliance rate. I think that is analogous to what we are doing here, because what we are trying to do is strengthen the hand. If a company raises their hand and says, I appeal, I want more time, I want to then we allow them to do that. But based on this amendment, my concern is, it says, quote, makes a determination that such debt cannot be collected pursuant to a levy. And that is the concern. And I am happy to yield time, if, or Mr. Jordan, I hope, would yield time if, if you would care to respond. Well, I, I think we have uh, almost exhausted the subject. But remember that the reference to levy actually refers to a formal program that exists in, in the Treasury Department known as the Federal Levy Collection Program, which is designed uh, to recoup back taxes from contractors. So the, all this says is the Secretary has to, uh, has to tell us that, uh, I'm sorry, I have exhausted that avenue, in which case suspension and debarment, pursuant to the language in your bill, uh, would occur. Uh, would the gentleman yield? I yield to the Chairman. Uh, this may be a question for Mr. Chaffetz, but my understanding, isn't it true that a levy which can be uh, fully paid 
within 10 years stops the process of going to serious delinquent. So aren't we talking here about people who are so far in arrears because of something that they, in most cases, willfully done, had done, such as the gentleman who uh, was withholding those taxes for their employees, who, by the way, get the credit for those taxes, even if they were never paid, withholding it, and then walking away with that money. In a situation like that, it is only really if there is more than 10 years to collect on it that they would go to the next step. Isn't that true? Uh, if you look at, yes, on page 7, a quote, the exception to this uh, uh, serious delinquent tax debt is, quote, a debt that is being paid in a timely manner pursuant to an agreement. And then it goes on from there. But that is the spirit. Which, look, you come into an agreement, you are trying to make whole, you are trying to get yourself back on the right track, you are not going to fall subject to this. We are trying to deal with the most egregious cases, the people who are truly, truly trying to game the system and give give the American taxpayer, give the American government more latitude in making sure that this doesn't happen, and that when they go to apply, they have to self-designate whether or not they are in compliance or not. I think that is information that we want to know before a contract is awarded. And if they are lying about that, then we can pursue the two other things. But in the cases that were cited in the GAO, I think we have addressed those. So I yield back to the Chairman. Anyone else request time? Hearing none, the question is on agreeing to the amendment offered by the gentleman from Virginia. On, on those, uh, all those in favor signify by raising aye or saying aye. aye. Those opposed, no. no. Uh, in the opinion of the chairs, the noes have it. The noes have it. And the amendment is not agreed to. Mr. Chairman. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, where, where am I hearing a voice from? Over here. Female. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm so, the Chair gentlelady from California, you are so far away, I regret. I know. I'm so far down the list. Uh, the gentlelady here. is recognized. Mr. Chair, I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment offered by Ms. Speer of California to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 829, page 3, line 7, and page 5, line 7 insert after the period in each place the following. If the head of an executive agency waives paragraph 1 for a person, the head of the agency shall submit to Congress within 30 days after the waiver is made a report containing the rationale for the waiver and relevant information supporting the waiver decision. The gentlelady from California is recognized for five minutes to explain her amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Be before explaining my amendment, let me just uh, say that, that I support this legislation. I think it is a privilege to serve as a Federal contractor. If you are not playing by the rules, you should be fired. And I have worked in this issue area for many years in the State Legislature in California. One of the biggest areas of failure is in child support enforcement. And oftentimes the only way that families access child support is through the ability to access the Federal tax returns or the State tax returns and the refunds that they receive from time to time. So keeping people accountable who work for the Federal Government should be a preamble. And I, I, I wholeheartedly support this. I actually think that the $100,000 um, threshold should be lowered because I think, again, it is a privilege to serve as a Federal contractor. Now, this particular amendment is very simple. It's transparency is what it really is um, requiring that we continue to hold as one of our uh, significant principles. And it basically requires the head of an agency within 30 days of providing a waiver to a contractor to report to Congress the rationale for that waiver and the relevant information supporting that decision. Would the gentlelady yield to the gentleman from Utah for? I certainly will. This is a great amendment. I am only disappointed I didn't think of it myself. So I wholeheartedly support it. It is a great amendment. I urge my colleagues to support it. Good on you. I am glad, uh, glad we can get this in the bill and I hope everybody will vote in support of it. Yield back. The question now occurs on the gentlelady's amendment offered by the gentlelady from California. All those in favor say, at a board, or say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. In the opinion of the Chair, the ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. Mr. Chairman.
Mr. Quigley, for what purpose does the gentleman seek recognition? I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. I don't expect any from the other. Mr. Quigley, is it um, 031, end in 031? You have two amendments. Uh, we don't have the numbering here. Does that mean we can consider amend block? <laughs> Well, the amendment offered by Mr. Quigley of Illinois to this the amendment. This is the 10-year to expand the database. Uh, by striking 5-year and instead of 10-year, yes. Okay. Uh, I just don't have the numbers on anything, okay. so I apologize. That's okay. Mr. Ed Chairman, I'd like to reserve a point of order. The gentleman reserves a point of order. Amendment the clerk will report. By Mr. Quigley of Illinois to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 829, at the end of the bill, add the following new section. Section 7, Improvement of Federal Awardee Performance and Integrity Information System Database. Section 872C <coughs> of Public Law 110-417-41 USC 417B. I ask unanimous consent to be considered as read. So ordered. Uh, before I recognize the gentleman, uh, for his point of order, uh, I want to make a brief comment uh, as to germane mis germane ger germaneness. The issue yeah. of germane. Germaneness. I will get that eventually uh, on amendments. We anticipate a number of amendments today that are not germane. The number, a number of these are good proposals and would be wholeheartedly accepted as uh, possible bills or amendments in other more broadly constructed language. However, we are considering narrowly tailored bills focused on addressing specific problems. If I make an exception for one non-germane amendment, it will be difficult, if not impossible, to exclude further off-topic amendments. As a result, it will be within the, as a result, the Chair will consider all germane amendments or all points of order narrowly as to their germaneness. I am happy to discuss non-germane proposals with sponsors uh, and with the ranking member, and I believe that many of those that we have seen draft forms would be very appropriate to put into freestanding or incorporate in other bills. And with that, I recognize the gentleman for, or I recognize the, the, the gentleman for his amendment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And in describing this amendment, I think it will get to the issue of um, germaneness. And that is, um, I, I think Mr. Chavitt's amendment, actually, his discussion was instructive as to those issues. Uh, the objective of this overall bill, which I wholeheartedly support, is to ensure contractor integrity. Uh, bearing this in mind, I would like to strengthen the bill by adding a provision that would ensure greater contractor integrity and oversight. Uh, my amendment would require all relevant contractor performance and conduct data from the last 10 years be included in the Federal Award Performance and Integrity Information System database. That is 10 years instead of 5. Now, what have we learned so far today? That people game the system, that they start corporations, end them, start them, end them, and, and game the system. When you apply for a job, you don't put in your last five years of employment only unless you are 24 years old or 25. No, you want to know more because you want to know what type of person is applying for this job. Ten years can tell you a lot more than five. And if it is in, in the section that you are actually amending with this bill, five years. What we have learned here today, and I just ask you to reconsider before you make a point here. And I understand that matters cannot be germane and that they can be trying to make a point elsewhere. All I am suggesting is today's debate has perhaps brought forth the concern I had in by proposing this amendment, that people are gaming the system. There is all kinds of things that they do, and it is quite possible that five years isn't enough for us to understand what kind of entity they are, what kind of person they are, and that the system, if this is all about improving the system and integrity, in the integrity of our contractors and individuals, 10 years gives us a lot more information to work with, and that is why I support this. Will the gentleman yield? I would yield. I, um, 
I support almost everything that, uh, that you said in, in those comments. I would love to work with you. I have got a good working relationship with you personally on a specific piece of legislation that could address that. I think it is, I have uh, no objection to that, but I will at the proper time uh, you know, raise my, my point of order because of the germaneness issue. Otherwise, I wish that we could pursue this, and, but it may be that another venue or another vehicle would be the way that we are able to address this. I just want to say that I do appreciate it. I think it is in the right spirit. It would provide a better a data, a, more sna a better snapshot um, uh, uh, as to the history. Um, but the germaneness issue is, I think, very real. I yield back. Does the gentleman yield? I yield back now. Thank you. The gentleman is recognized on his point of order. I object to the amendment because it is not germane to the bill. House Rule 16, Clause 7 requires amendments to be on the same subject as the bill under consideration. The gentleman's amendment is not on the same subject as the bill under consideration and therefore is not germane. I am prepared to rule. H.R. 829 relates to contractors and grantees that have seriously delinquent tax debts. The gentleman's amendment would expand the period of the, of the time that records are maintained in the Federal procurement data system and is unrelated to tax delinquent contractors and grantees. As such, the amendment is not germane and is not in order. So ruled. However, I would like to take a point of privilege and say to the gentleman that if he will author a bill, a standalone bill, I am not completely confident, but I will check. It may well be a good suspension bill, something that could flow through this committee quickly and become law, and I certainly, along with Mr. Chaffetz, would support it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Are there any other amendments? Mr. Chairman. Uh, the gentleman from Massachusetts. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Hearing. I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment when you get it. Amendment offered by Mr. Tierney of Massachusetts to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 829. Page 5, insert after line 16 the following new section and redesignate the succeeding sections accordingly. The amendment will consider, be considered as read. Uh, the gentleman from Massachusetts is recognized to explain. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman uh, I would like to reserve a point of order. The gentleman reserves a point of order. The gentleman from Massachusetts is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, this amendment I, I think will withstand a point of order uh, that has been raised and that I note the title of the bill is not the Tax Accountability Bill, but the uh, Contracting and Tax Accountability uh, Bill on that. And this amendment is very simple. Uh, what it says is it would stop rewarding foreign companies with contracts and grants if they refuse to cooperate with investigations into their activities by the United States Government. Now, our Government relies on hundreds of contractors around the world for a variety of different functions. But unlike local companies, U.S. companies, foreign companies generally are not subject to the United States law. Uh, they are not required to comply with subpoenas, for example, that require them to produce documents during pending investigations of fraud, overcharging, or other abuses. The Marshal's Office also understandably prefers not to personally serve subpoenas on the territory of foreign countries. Under this amendment, if a foreign company is under investigation by an entity of the United States Government that follows all of the proper procedures to issue a subpoena, it will be up to that foreign company to decide how to respond. On the one hand, the foreign company could cooperate, it could designate a company official to be served with a subpoena, and it could produce the required documents. Like United States companies, the foreign company could agree to receive the subpoena by fax or other electronic means, but it would not have to station an official permanently inside the United States. On the other hand, the company could refuse to cooperate. It could refuse to designate a company official to receive the subpoena, it could deny service of subpoena, it could ignore United States demands, and it could refuse to provide any documents to the United States Government. All that my amendment says is that if the company chooses the second path, the path of refusing to cooperate, it will be referred for debarment and it could lose the ability to receive any additional Federal funds. Now, this solution doesn't require the company to do anything and it does not extend U.S. jurisdiction overseas. But here is what it does do. It stops rewarding companies with millions of additional U.S. taxpayer dollars when they refuse to cooperate with Federal investigations. This amendment would apply to subpoenas issued by any Federal agency, including the Department of Justice, as well as committees of Congress, including this one. This amendment addresses a very real problem, one that this committee has had firsthand experience with. 
Last year, the Subcommittee on National Security and Foreign Affairs initiated an investigation into allegations that a multibillion-dollar fuel contractor for the United States military in Afghanistan and Central Asia had engaged in corruption with the former first family of Kyrgyzstan. While the Subcommittee initially requested documents from the company, the company refused to cooperate. After further stonewalling, Chairman Towns agreed to subpoena the documents. The company refused service of process overseas and actively sought to avoid enforcement of the subpoenas. We quickly discovered that there was little that we could do to enforce a subpoena on a foreign contractor. Even though the United States taxpayers had paid the company over $4 billion in the past decade, there was simply no way to compel them to cooperate with a duly authorized subpoena from the United States House of Representatives. For its part, the Pentagon stated that nothing in the contract would allow them to punish the foreign contractor for not cooperating with the subpoena. So this amendment would close this loophole and make sure that foreign contractors cooperate with duly authorized subpoenas or else face the same consequences of any American corporation, debarment from contracting with the United States. Now, I know Mr. Chaffetz earlier had mentioned in response to Mr. Connolly's uh, amendment that you wanted to give preference to those people to play by the rules. Well, when the United States contractors are playing by the rules and they are served with a subpoena, they have to respond. Uh, and what this amendment would say is that when foreign corporations are served with a subpoena, uh, they have a choice. They cannot respond and be subject to debarment proceedings and all that is detailed with it, go under the usual fire process, or they could comply. Would but the gentleman me, yield? I will yield. I would be prepared to accept this amendment if it were, in my opinion, germane, and I know the point of order hasn't been spoken. I am further prepared, similar to Mr. Quigley's, to support and uh, co-sponsor a standalone bill and to support it through the process and, and assure it a markup here. I, like former Chairman Towns, was outraged that we were unable to get the facts we were entitled to and that a contractor just because they were foreign, found themselves in a preferred position. Nothing could be worse than to have American contractors subject to subpoenas, both, both from the Justice and from us, and find companies who have not played by the rules, have bribed, have been part of corruption that is a felony for a U.S. company to do, finding themselves above and beyond that. So uh, although I think Mr. Towns is, willing, is very interested to say the same thing and I, and I want him to do it, uh, I look forward to working with you on a separate piece of legislation. I yield back. You are reclaiming my time. I, I thank the Chairman for that. And, and should this uh, vote on Germain does not go uh, the way we wish it would, and, and I wouldn't take odds that it will, uh, I, I, I would welcome that opportunity to do that. And just reiterate again, I think you know, we certainly have the authority in this committee to accept this amendment. Uh, regardless of your feelings about Germane or something like that, I think there is a good argument that it is germane, given the title and the intent of, your, of the law itself, which is both accountability, contract accountability, as well as tax accountability. Well, uh, but I will yield to Mr. Well, Towns if he wishes to make a comment. First of all, I, I would hope that it is germane, but if it is not, then I really think that uh, we should move forward to, with legislation that will deal with it. However, uh, I am hoping that it is germane so we can deal with it and deal with it effectively today. And, of course, uh, uh, I know you have done a lot of work in this area, and I think that uh, uh, that is something else that we uh, have to respect and we need to do something, because we can't have uh, a foreign um, uh, contractor having advantages over an American contractor. That just doesn't make sense to me. On that note, I yield back. The gentleman yield. The gentleman yield. I will yield to the, Mr. Cummings. Uh, I want to, uh, Mr. Chairman, I want to associate myself with the words of my colleagues, Mr. Towns and uh, Mr. Tierney. Uh, we have uh, had our discussions about subpoenas and trying to make sure that people adhere to them. And I think when you've got these foreign companies doing what they are doing, it's just, it goes, and, I, and, and you've said it, it goes against everything we stand for. And it is like they, you know, they just say, the hell with you. We, we, we don't have to do it. So, and yet and still they still benefit, which is, which is what makes it even worse. It is like uh, throwing mud in our faces. So I am um, hoping that it will be found germane, like Mr. Towns, Mr. Journey. But, Mr. Chairman, um, if it is not, we hope to make this a top priority so that we can get legislation passed into the floor as soon as possible. And I want to thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. 
The gentleman from Utah, Mr. Chaffetz, seeks recognition. Yes, I, I object. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. I object to the amendment because it is not germane to the bill. House Rule 16, Clause 7 requires amendments to be on the same subject as the bill under consideration. The gentleman's amendment is not on the same subject as the bill under consideration and therefore is not germane. Would the gentleman yield? Yes. Um, I was just wondering, do you share our views that uh, the subject matter of the bill is very in, important? And uh, it would allow, a bill would allow us to be able to do our work better. And would you do you have the same sentiments as the chairman? Did you work with us to, if in, in, if it's not found to be germane? Did you work with us to get a piece of legislation passed? Yes, reclaiming my time, I absolutely want to give the tools uh, as many tools as possible to make sure there's as much compliance as possible. This will be tricky given international law and how. Uh, different uh, uh, countries have different constitutions and whatnot. But I think the spirit of what Mr. Tierney is saying is absolutely spot on. And it makes me wonder and begs the question as to why this is not a provision on all contracts anyway. Um, it seems that that would be the easiest, swiftest way to do this is to include a provision in those contracts uh, for payment uh, overseas. Uh, but I, to, the, to my uh, friend, the ranking member, yes, I would love to work on a separate piece of legislation and do whatever we can to strengthen our hand. That is that's what we are trying to do. Thank you. Yield back. I am prepared to rule on H.R. 829 as it relates to contractors and guarantees uh, that are seriously delinquent. The gentleman's amendment would propose for debarment foreign contractors that refuse to comply with feder a Federal subpoena and is therefore unrelated to tax delinquency of contractors or grantees. And as such, the amendment, regrettably, is not germane. Are there any other amendments at this time? Good. If there is no further discussion, the question is on the amendment and the nature of a substitute offered by the gentleman from Utah. All those in favor say aye. All those opposed? In the opinion of the Chair, the ayes have it. The, motion, the uh, bill is agreed to. If there is no further discussion, I move that oh, wait a second here. Yeah, I move that the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform report H.R. 821 to the House with the recommendation that it do pass as amended. The question is on favorably reporting H.R. 829 to the House. All those in favor? Signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed? No. In the opinion of the Chair, the ayes have it, the ayes have it, and the bill is agreed to. Oops. I ask unanimous consent that staff be authorized to make necessary conforming and technical changes to the bill. Without objection, the motion is agreed to. The committee will now consider H.R. 828, the Federal Employee Tax Accountability Act of 2011. I commend Congressman Chaffetz for introducing this legislation, which does nothing to change the terms and conditions of employment of Federal employees who are making a good faith effort to pay their fair taxes. Employees who, con who continu continuously ignore the channels and process to make and fulfill the tax obligation must be held accountable. The IRS can fire Federal employees who do not pay their taxes. It is notable that the noncompliance rate among the IRS employees is less than 1 percent, compared with 3.35 percent for the, the Federal civilian counterparts who owe taxes of more than $1.5 billion. For that reason, we believe all Federal employees should be covered under similar legislation to that that the IRS holds itself to. And with that, I recognize the ranking member for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Federal employees are required by executive order and by regulation to satisfy in good faith their obligations as citizens, especially those such as uh, Federal, State, or local taxes that are imposed by law. Government lawyers and auditors and all employees who have who are paid with Federal tax dollars must pay their taxes. The vast majority of Federal workers take this obligation seriously, as evidenced by the fact that the tax compliance rate 
in the Federal community is much higher than among the general public. According to the most recent IRS statistics, more than 96 percent of Federal workers paid their taxes on time and do not owe delinquent debts to the government. So I am not convinced that the problem of noncompliance with tax rules by Federal workers justifies adoption of a new law that applies only to them. I also have a number of concerns about the way that this bill is currently drafted. First, this legislation may have the opposite uh, of intended effect by significantly increasing the cost to taxpayers. The bill could actually undermine the government's efforts to collect unpaid taxes from Federal employees who are already having their wages garnished by the government. If these employees are fired, their wages are no longer garnished. Further, we do not know what it will cost Federal agencies to engage a small army of employees to comb through court records in, in potentially every State and locality in the country seeking tax liens. And we don't know if these costs will actually be offset by increased tax collections. I am also concerned that workers who owe Federal taxes but are currently unable to pay will be treated unfairly by this bill. We have a number of amendments on the Democratic side designed to improve the bill. I encourage the majority to accept all of them. And let's make sure that our first priority is protecting the interests of the United States taxpayers rather than rushing to make hasty decisions that advance bad policy and undermine those interests. Uh, and, Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent that letters from the American Federation of Government Employees, the National Treasury Employees Union, and the Federal Managers Association opposing H.R. 828 be placed in the record. And I would just like to note that I am without, without objection, so ordered. Thank you. And I would just like to note, Mr. Chairman, that I am in agreement with the Federal Managers Association's characteriz characterization of this bill. Uh, the letter states, while common sense and straightforward on its face, uh, this headline-grabbing legislation aims to provide a simple solution to a multifaceted problem in a complex tax world. And so, Mr. Chairman, I thank you and I yield back. I thank the gentleman. We will hold the record open until the end of the day for members to provide their written statements. We will now open the bill, H.R. 828, for consideration. Without objection, H.R. 828 will be considered as read and open for amendment at any time. The text has already been distributed to each of your folders. The clerk will designate the bill. H.R. 828, a bill to amend Title V, United States Code, to provide that persons having seriously delinquent tax debts shall be ineligible for Federal employment. The gentleman from Utah has an amendment in the nature of a substitute. The amendment has been distributed. Without objection, the amendment will be considered read and original text for purposes of amendment. And with that, I will recognize the gentleman from Utah to explain his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It is uh, it's an honor to introduce this piece of legislation. Many of the principles that we had earlier today uh, in our discussion about making sure that contractors pay their Federal taxes, I think should also apply for Federal workers to pay their taxes. It is an honor and a privilege to work for the Federal Government. The overwhelming majority of people do a good job. They work hard. They are patriotic. I mean, you cannot say enough good things about the overwhelming majority of people who do work in the Federal Government and apply and want to become a Federal worker in one degree or another. But at the same time, we do have a problem, and the problem is getting considerably worse. According to the IRS, in 2004, we had 102,794 Federal employees who did not pay $599.8 million in taxes. Moving forward to 2009, that number decreased a little bit. There were, according to the IRS, 99,036 Federal employees who didn't pay over a billion dollars in taxes. The number stayed very, fairly consistent. I mean, it came down a little over uh, 3,700 people between 2004 and 2009. But we went from $600 million in unpaid Federal taxes to over a billion dollars in unpaid taxes. And that ain't right. That is not right. What this bill tries to do is to say, if you are going through a process, if you are going through a payment plan, if you are trying to do the right thing, you will not be affected by this bill. 
But if you're not, if you get to that category that is called serious delinquent tax debt, which we have defined, then we're left at no position, and I think we should go to the point where we actually fire and let go of that Federal employee, because they're not doing the right thing. They're not trying to make whole. They're, they're so upside down that we can't make them whole. That to me seems like the reasonable, fair thing to do. And at a time with high, high unemployment, people who are willing and wanting to do the right thing, I think we have a moral obligation to, to, to do this. If you are willing to cheat your taxes and if you are willing to skirt the system, what does that say about what kind of quality of work you may be doing for the Federal Government? Now, again, I want to be fair. The overwhelming majority of people do a great job, but we have too many people not paying their taxes. There is something like close to 700 people working on Capitol Hill that fall into this category, and we need to address that. Now, interestingly enough, the IRS, dealing with its own internal challenges, had employees that weren't paying their taxes. So they took it a step further and implemented uh, a program that has been highly successful. It is no coincidence that the highest degree of compliance is found within the IRS. That wasn't the case years ago. They strengthened their hand. They made it crystal clear that you have to comply with your taxes, and it worked. What we are trying to do is to make sure that every department and agency has a reasonable plan in place that gives them the tools to make sure that applicants as they come through the system are, are highlighted as falling into this category that is unacceptable, and that if you are a current Federal employee, that you are actually going through a process. Again, if you are going through and you are trying to say, hey, look, I've got to, I, I, I disagree, then you are exempted from this. But there comes a point where we actually have to hold the line and say, you know what? You owe these taxes. You can't work here if you are not going to be on a payment plan. So that is the nature of the bill. The principles are the same. The principles are the same with contractors. If we expect the contractors to live up to these obligations, the Federal workers should also have to live up to these, uh, these obligations as well. It is fair. It is right. It is a privilege to work for the Federal Government. And we are going to have to deal with the fact that we still have nearly 100,000 Federal employees who aren't doing the right thing. Um, and with that, I will yield back. Mr. Chairman. Uh, the Chair now recognizes the ranking member for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Chairman, this amendment does little to address my underlying concerns about this bill. And I want to make it very clear, Mr. Chairman, I, I believe that that 4 percent of Federal employees ought to be paying every single dime that they owe. And I don't think you will get any argument from the folks on this side. Under this amendment, Federal employees are still not protected from unfair uh, treatment based on hardships such as medical or other financial emergencies that may temporarily impair an employee's ability to pay their taxes. You know, in our economy right now, um, you have got a lot of people going through uh, difficult times, losing their jobs. And when we see the reasons for, for example, for bankruptcies, uh, one of the main reasons is that people uh, go through medical situations that are very, very difficult to address. And so under this amendment, it is also not clear what due process, if any, employees would receive prior to their termination. Further, like the original text, this amendment also undermines current collection efforts, an outcome that would likely increase rather than decrease the potential costs to taxpayers. Further, I continue to have questions about the requirement that agencies review public rec records to seek tax liens. At the same time, we are uh, cutting back on the money that IRS uh, has for its employees. This amendment does not explain how they are supposed to do this or how they are supposed to pay for those efforts. Without knowing the answers to these questions, it is impossible to know whether it is in the interest of taxpayers to hire additional employees to go around checking Federal, State and county records across the country for employee tax liens. I know we have a number of perfecting amendments on the Democratic side, and I encourage the majority to accept them and listen to the, the arguments very carefully. Basically, what we, they go to is fairness and making sure people have due process. Uh, with that, Would the gentleman yield? Of course. 
I agree with the gentleman that we want to make sure that safeguards are in place. And seeing that even the safeguards of existing processes uh, under the arbitration policy, no one can be fired from the Federal workforce without a series of, of protections that are in existing, plus, of course, collective bargaining. But Mr. Lynch came to us with a number of very good suggestions. We have been working with him. I believe he will offer them here today, and I believe they will take care of most, if not all, of your concerns. And I thank the gentleman for his concerns, and I particularly want to thank uh, Mr. Lynch for working so diligently to, uh, to improve this bill. Hopefully that he will offer that amendment. Thank the gentleman. Thank you, and reclaiming my time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We, again, I want to emphasize that on this side of the aisle, we, we share uh, the concerns of trying to make sure tax dollars are paid. And, um, and so uh, with that, I will yield back. Thank you. Does anyone else seek time? The gentlelady uh, from the District of Columbia is recognized. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, 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 my, I, this is really in the nature of a question. I want to make sure I understand. The, the, the gentleman, gentlelady is recognized for a question. When the, uh, when the gentleman offered, uh, when we had this discussion in the last Congress, uh, the gentleman, uh, the concerns were essentially that we deal with contractors and we deal with taxpayers, uh, Federal employees, in, in the same way. I strongly support that. I think the uh, American people would be outraged if they thought we were keeping, and the gentleman used the word cheat, che uh, cheaters on, on, and they were paying cheaters while they were paying their own taxes. Uh, so I am looking in this bill for that mirror image. Side by side, we have treated contractors and Federal employees the same way. I noted that for federal for contractors there was a waiver prevention. Is that not the case? I believe that's correct. Uh, is there a waiver prevention for hardship for federal employees? I mean, I have uh, in mind. I believe the gentlelady will see that come to pass as soon as the First Amendment is offered. Uh, uh, that would be very important. <laughs> These could not be harder times. Uh, for any of us, but certainly for Federal employees. And I, you can, you, I can imagine um, the television coming up with some Federal employee who had been a model worker for uh, 15 years and a, a, a child got leukemia. Uh, and even though they had uh, the insurance that we provide for Federal employees, this child needed a special medicine, so there was nothing to do. Uh, but uh, when they had, you can just he see it now, when they had moved out of their house and now they don't have a job, uh, because there was no way for the agency to waive for them uh, the taxes until they could pay them. Uh, in that case, by the way, Mr. Chairman, I believe the IRS would be easier on that employee than this bill may be at the time, because you can be, be put in a non-collectible status. Uh, that is the IRS. We certainly don't want to be tougher on Federal employees than the IRS is. So if I can be assured that there is going to be a mirror image waiver for uh, Federal employees, uh, my concerns would be satisfied with respect to that issue. I thank the gentlelady. And although the gentleman from Missouri has a seek re recognition, I would ask him to consider allowing the gentleman from Massachusetts to offer his amendment first. The gentleman is recognized for his amendment. I, I thank the chairman. Uh, Mr. Ch Mr. Chairman, I believe I do have an amendment at the desk. <coughs> the clerk will report. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 828 offered by Mr. Lynch of Massachusetts. The amendment will be considered as read. The gentleman is recognized to explain his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I thank you for yielding. While we all share an interest in promoting greater tax compliance, I want to make it clear that I still have very serious reservations with the approach that the majority suggests uh, as it relates to Federal employees' tax delinquency. Uh, it seems that in an unamended form we would treat multinational corporations uh, with, with 100 attorneys in the same way that we would treat the janitor at the Bureau of, of Printing and Engraving. I think it is important to note that our Federal workers are some of the most dedicated and hardworking employees in our country. And while I, I applaud the, the, the sponsor, Mr. Chaffetz of Utah, and the chairman for, for exempting military personnel, I th think that, that was wise and appropriate. I also want to point out, as both those members know, 
uh, because of your, your, uh, your visits to war zones in Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, presently, we have uh, thousands of civilian employees uh, from the Treasury Department, from Agriculture Department, from the DEA, from State Department, uh, FBI, Justice Department, who are working side by side our military over in, in those war zones overseas, yet they would be uh, they would not be exempt uh, in many cases uh, from from the the effect of this legislation. Uh, so we uh, we also have uh, public employees, government employees assisting with the tsunami and earthquake torn Japan. So I often feel that so our public servants don't get the respect and recognition that they deserve for their contributions, including contribu contributions to their, their tax liability. As mentioned by the ranking member, federal employees and retirees e exhibit a tax compliance rate of about 96.6 percent. And importantly, uh, we have an enhanced ability to make sure that federal employees pay their taxes. And that comes from the fact that we pay them. We pay them. And so we have the ability to make sure that they are tax compliant. And we have an assortment of garnishment uh, mechanisms where we can say, if you are not paying your taxes, we are going to garnish your pay and make sure that you do. And there are, there are many, many employees who are uh, actually participating in those, those types of programs. Uh, if you look especially over at HUD and elsewhere, we already have that enhanced capacity to require compliance uh, with their Federal pay obligations. As the gentleman from Utah, Mr. Chaffetz, may recall from testimony and discussion presented before the Federal Workforce Subcommittee last Congress, there are some additional options or more useful measures that could probably be employed to address any ongoing delinquency problems. To that end, my, my amendment was simply uh, it takes some of the recommendations from that hearing and incorporates them into this base bill. For example, the amendment would add Section uh, 6331 of the IRS Code, which deals with levies and wage garnishments uh, to the series of exemptions listed under the definition of seriously delinquent tax debt under this bill. Since we are talking about Federal workers here, the IRS is certainly capable of recouping any unpaid taxes from garnishing uh, Federal employees' wages and earnings with full interest and penalties, and in fact, in many cases, is already doing so uh, currently. However, if an employee is out of a job simply due to the noticing of a lien, which is suggested in the current bill, which occurs fairly early on, believe it or not, in the, in the collection process, the likelihood that any tax debt would be satisfied diminishes significantly. People who are out of work have a reduced capacity to pay their, their taxes back. Uh, in addition to wage garnishment, the amendment also excludes economic hardship levies from definition of seriously delinquent tax debt. As, as the gentlelady from the District of Columbia pointed out, we have folks uh, in situations where uh, because of uh, uh, fatal in, uh, illness uh, in the family uh, have their, their funds completely depleted. Uh, in addition to wage garnishment, the, uh, the further amendment would ensure employees' due process rights are protected and provides for a 90-day grace period for employees to demonstrate that they are making efforts to come into compliance. Lastly, the amendment would require regulation uh, to be promulgated by the Office of Personnel Management in consultation with the Internal Revenue Service uh, to make sure we, we tighten up the process so that we, we don't have a big lag, that we don't have a significant number of employees who are, who are not brought into compliance in a, in a fairly quick period of time. I think that requires more diligence on, on the part of, of management, and we would like to work with OPM and the IRS uh, having, having them work together on this. But I feel strongly that the bill should not go forward without these practical provisions. So my hope is that my, our colleagues will join me in, in support of this amendment, and I yield back the balance of our time. Thank you. I thank the gentleman, and although the Chair is prepared to accept these amendments, I would recognize the gentleman from Utah. I appreciate the gentleman's amendment, uh, the gentleman from Massachusetts. I, I have two, two brief questions. Uh, page 2, line 10, you say 90 days. I was wondering if the gentleman would be, I, I worry about dragging this on, that if the gentleman would be, um, uh, would consider reducing that to 45 days, this will be first and foremost in that employee's mind, no doubt about it. 
Um, and then the second question I have is, if we were to accept this amendment and vote in favor of it, uh, would the gentleman uh, support the, the overall bill? Um, let, let me just say, say a couple of things. First of all, I, I think that we have a, a, it's a, it's a two-week process on notification usually to the, to the employees. So uh, 45 days would become 30 days under your uh, proposal. What I would suggest is, is make it 60 days. That way they at least get two, two notice periods in there. Uh, I, I would certainly, I, I think, well, I, you know, I, I think 90 days is, is, is necessary. I am willing to, 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 to work with the gentleman, and if we made it 60 days, I think there would be a, a fair opportunity for notice to the employee. And, yes, if, if with, that, with, that, uh, with that refinement here, uh, friendly amendment, uh, I certainly would vote for the bill if, it, if, if the amendment were included. Uh, reclaiming my time, I appreciate that. If we can work with the gentleman and the chairman uh, and the ranking member to adjust that from 90 days to 60 days, I would recommend to, to my colleagues that we accept this amendment. Uh, if the gentleman would yield, I would ask unanimous consent that the amendment be uh, struck to uh, amend to 60 days rather than 90 days. So ordered. I will continue. And, and uh, just in conclusion, Mr. Chairman, before I yield back, I just uh, suggest that we uh, accept this amendment. I appreciate the gentleman from Massachusetts' uh, approach to this. I know he, he has a heart of gold and cares as much about Federal employees as anyone. Um, and, and I appreciate working with him uh, uh, on a host of issues, and particularly this one, and would recommend to my colleagues that we accept this amendment and uh, strengthen the bill. Yield back. Would the gentleman yield to Mr. Platts? Yes. Before I yield back, though. I, I think it's my, is it my time or no? I would I yield think it's to Mr. Actually Platts my... as well. Now, we will both yield to Mr. All Platts. Right, All right. Mr. Platts, you have got about 2 minutes and 30 seconds. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Chairman, Mr. Chairman, for yielding. Um, would uh, the uh, maker of the amendment uh, be willing to respond to just an inquiry? Mr. Yes, I, I just want to, I want to thank uh, the gentleman from Utah for his kind words, and, and I appreciate the, the, uh, the work he did on the underlying bill as well. And uh, you know, I, I think we've, we've batted this around a bit, so uh, I don't want to re reduce the chances of my amendment <laughs> passing. It seems like we are in agreement right now, so why don't we go ahead. Uh, I yield I, to the gentleman uh, from Pennsylvania. Reclaiming my time. I just had one question that uh, your amendment, uh, as offered, would um, the additional exception, the, the um, Part C that you are offering, would include those who are in the Treasury offset program that they are paying where there is an automatic deduction from their payroll. That is what is included in Section C, correct? That, that is Yielding. correct as, as I read it. And also, I think it would be covered under the gentleman's original description of, of seriously delinquent, delinquent uh, under that exemption. I believe uh, uh, Mr. Gentleman from Utah had already carved that out. So if they are participating in that Treasury uh, repayment program, they would, be, they would not be considered uh, seriously delinquent. Okay. Re reclaim my time. I just uh, appreciate the uh, gentleman from Massachusetts working with the um, subcommittee chair and including these additional um, common sense uh, revisions and, and, and support the amendment. Thank you. All time having expired, the question is on agreeing to the amendment offered by the gentleman from Massachusetts. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? The ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. Is there any, are there any other further amendments? Good. We will move to the close. Mr. Mr. Chairman? I paused too long. The gentleman from Virginia. I don't have an amendment. I just wanted to speak to the bill. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. I thank the chairman. And I appreciate the, uh, the bipartisan comedy just exhibited in uh, accepting uh, amendments from Mr. Lynch. Um, but I believe we are I believe that this legislation, just as it was last year, is frankly aimed at public employees. Uh, we have already heard the statistic that there actually isn't a problem of any magnitude to be solved. And while all of us would agree that everybody should pay their taxes, um, so should members of Congress. Maybe we should have an amendment to this bill that first applies to ourselves. Any member of Congress, delinquent in his or her taxes, is automatically suspended from the Congress. Let's, that, that would be about as much due process as, in fact, we are giving Federal employees. We are targeting Federal employees in this legislation 
for a reason, and it is not because we need the tax revenue. It is part and parcel of a general assault on public employees in this country and in this Congress. And while the amendments just adopted make it a better piece of legislation, I wish not to be associated with it. I wish not to be associated with a movement that has made public employees a punching bag. It is, to me, wrongheaded and morally wrong. Public service is a noble calling. Public employees work diligently on behalf of the constituents we serve every day, and they ought to be treated with respect and dignity and not treated or talked about as if they are nothing more than uh, scallywags and tax delinquents. And I fear that by passing this bill today, we are enabling just such rhetoric and just such attitudes. And therefore, reluctantly, Mr. Chairman, while I certainly agree all taxes should be collected and all Americans should pay their taxes, Federal employees, members of Congress and anybody else, I cannot support this bill and be part of the movement to denigrate further public employees. I Would yield. the gentleman yield? I yield. I, uh, I know those comments were, were heartfelt. And I want to associate myself with part of what you had to say. It is not the intention and should not be the intention of this committee to forget that 96 point some percent of all Federal employees have no tax problems at all. And the vast majority of those who have tax problems are dealing with them in an honest and fair way, many of them having had reversals, small business losses and other reasons. So I would join with the gentleman in saying that I hope if this bill becomes law that it will have just the opposite effect of what you fear, that, in fact, we will have set a high standard. People in the Federal workforce will be able to say, we have the lowest failure to pay our taxes in the entire United States. We also have strong rules that make sure that the very, very, very few, whether they are contractors or Federal employees directly, in fact, make those restitutions or do not have a job. And I would hope that we would look at the part of the cup that is full in the future. I realize today that is difficult for us to know if it will have that effect. I, for one, will be championing the fact that we have held ourselves as Federal employees to the highest level and that, in fact, our workers are the workers who pay their taxes, play by the rules, or don't work for the Federal Government. So I hope in the future we can look at it the other way. I realize today that may be difficult and yield back. And, and I want to thank the Chairman for his sentiments. I know they are as sincerely felt as my own. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Chairman Yield. Uh, I yield to the Ranking Member. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I, I too, uh, want to um, express my um, appreciation for Mr. Connolly and his comments. And I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and all of us. I think we have worked together here very, uh, very effectively and efficiently today. And I think it has been in a spirit of bipartisanship. But I want to enter into a brief colloquy with you, Mr. Chairman, about discussion that we had a little bit earlier with regard to um, the process and your discussions or the staff's discussions with regard to IRS and as far as firing people. Um, and you had shared with me some things. And I would just like for you to, to share them with the committee, if you don't mind. Uh, certainly, if the gentleman would yield. Uh, yeah. in, our, in our investigation, we found that as a practical matter, very few, if any, people would ever be fired under this law, that this law would, would in fact only be for that very rare case in which even after there is a levy, even after there is payment, there is a refusal. There is the possibility, there are two possibilities in which we, we know this could happen. One would be a new hire who came in with the baggage could well find themselves outside of compliance and have that questioned uh, at the time of their application. Now, that is a practical matter for OPM because the bill is silent as to pre-employment checking. The second one would be that rare case in which somebody is so head over heels that, in fact, the IRS cannot recover it within 10 years, they are seriously delinquent, and none of the waivers provided under this would be provided. It is my view that many of the protections within the Federal workforce in the dismissal process would still weigh in, but I can't be sure of that. The one thing that consistent, Mr. Uh, Ranking Member, with what Mr. Connolly said is that the goal here is, even though that may be a fraction of a fraction of 1 percent, 
it is the statement that we hold ourselves to a high level that I believe Mr. Chaffetz is trying to get to. Uh, and that is why in my opening comments, I was very specific to talk about this large number in dollars of delinquency, but to make it clear that the vast majority of those are, are making payments. They are people who got behind, whether in some cases contractors, but certainly for the Federal workforce. Uh, and so I shared that with you in advance, because I don't believe this is pure symbolism, although it is almost pure symbolism. It does give bragging rights to the Federal workforce that they live to the highest standard. And I think there is a value to that, to the people on talk radio who often talk about Federal workers as though they are somehow not dedicated, not hardworking, and not earning the vast majority, if not more, than they are paid. So I thank the gentleman for his question. The, um, and reclaiming my time, I just I want us to be very careful. Um, you know, this, this, uh, these statements that I hear quite often uh, about federal employees and public employees. I, I mean, I, I really take them kind of personally since I am a public employee. But also because you know, when I drove in here, uh, got here around six o'clock this morning, I go to the gym. I see people getting, coming to work, taking the early, early train to get to work, and then late at night they work, and a lot of them are sitting behind us. And I think that, you know, I hope that, you know, when federal employees watch this, I hope that they understand that we fully appreciate what they do every day. Uh, and the difference that they make and the, and the things that they do to make life better, whether they are on the re Republican side or Democratic side. They, and a lot of them are sacrificing tremendously. And so I would like to emphasize the 96 percent that are doing the right thing. Um, and I would assume that some of that 4 percent are people who are really going through some, some difficulties and some problems, uh, particularly in these very very tough economic times. And so uh, with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Yield to the gentleman from Pennsylvania. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will be brief. I, I just want to uh, comment, uh, gentleman from Virginia. I think all of us share the, um, the important work of our fellow public employees um, and, and want to emphasize that you know, this legislation is, is not to be an attack on them, but um, and truly about fairness. And, and I will look at it in the sense of the, the 96 percent that are paying their taxes and the overwhelming majority of the, of the four remaining percent that are not current in their taxes are trying to be. They are in repayment. They have agreements. They are in the top program, the Treasury offset program. It is going to be a very, very small number, uh, you know, maybe a fraction of a percent that would be impacted by this bill. And I would say that is a matter of fairness to those hardworking employees who are paying their taxes and those who are struggling to but have taken responsibility. Because for that most junior Federal employee who is working hard out there paying their taxes, to know that maybe someone working alongside of them is not paying their taxes and not even making an effort to pay their taxes, that is an insult to the, to the employee who is. And, and so it is not only do I share the belief, um, since I was about 14, I knew I wanted to be a public servant because I believe in the ideals of public service. I, I think what the, the gentleman from Utah is, is trying to make sure that we show respect to all Americans, including the 99 point whatever percent of public employees who either are current or are trying to be current, that they are respected for, for doing their best to uh, be fully complied. With that, I yield back. With the gentleman yield? So I'd uh, be glad to yield to the gentleman. I, look, in the notion of uh, fairness and open and transparency, we have a number of people here for the first uh, time. We had a hearing on this last year. Uh, again, I concur with all the comments about the overwhelming majority of Federal workers doing the right thing, working hard, paying their taxes. But when we asked the IRS of the 100 or so thousand people um, how many would move into this status, her answer was 12 percent, or roughly 12,000 Federal employees would actually fall into this category. So we talk about a fraction of 1 percent. I just feel an obligation to tell you it is not four or five people. We are talking about 12,000 people out of the 100,000 that would actually move into this lien status that we would be dealing with immediately. And again, I want this bill to pass because I think we need to have a bigger, um, better tool in place 
uh, to get compliance. But in full disclosure, if you go back and look at her testimony, she estimates 12 percent of the 100,000. Thank you. And re reclaiming my time, I, I think it is important to reference the 12,000. If I do my math quickly in my head, that would be about one half of 1 percent of Federal employees. And that goes to the point that 99.5 percent are compliant or are trying to be compliant. And so you know, we are trying to target that, that half percent that are just not accepting personal responsibility for their finances and rightfully should be held accountable as, as you are seeking to do. With that, I yield back. Thank you. The question is on the amendment and the nature of a substitute offered from the, by the gentleman from Utah. All those in favor say aye. aye. In, uh, all those opposed say no. In the opinion of the Chair, the ayes have it and the amendment is agreed to. I, I move that the Committee on uh, Oversight and Government Report Reform report H.R. 828 to the House with the recommendation that do pass as amended. No, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. The, the gentleman wasn't here, here earlier. Does the gentleman have an amendment? Yes. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 828 offered by Mr. Davis of Illinois. Page 2, line 12, strike the comma and all that follows through the semicolon in line 13 and insert a semicolon. The, the clerk will suspend it. You consider it as read. Mr. Davis, you, you will explain your amendment. You have five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And uh, the amendment that I am offering is pretty straightforward and simple in that it strikes both the United States Postal Service as well as the Postal Regulatory Commission from the list of agencies subjected to the bill's provision. As I am sure everyone is well aware, the Postal Service does not rely on appropriations or taxpayer dollars to carry out its operations. Since 1971, the Postal Service has basically functioned as a self-sustaining enterprise, supporting itself through the sale of postage stamps and mail service delivery. So if the fundamental premise of H.R. 828 is that employees paid from taxpayer dollars should be current on their Federal taxes, then it seems unfair and inappropriate to include employees of the Postal Service and its regulatory body, the Postal Regulatory Commission, in the underlying bill. And while I think we are all in agreement on the importance of tax compliance, I urge caution on the part of our committee in considering legislation that may potentially impact the Postal Service's bottom line. As we discussed at great length during last week's hearing on the future viability and sustainability of certain Postal Service costs, the financial condition of the Postal Service continues to be challenged by modern modes of communication and the recent sluggish growth in the American economy. Furthermore, we heard a good deal about the billions of dollars in cost reductions that the Postal Service has achieved over the past couple of years. However, we also heard about the difficulties the Postal Service is experiencing in addressing costs that are out of their control, such as the statutorily mandated payments to the Retiree Health Benefits Fund that average about $5.5 billion a year. In light of these circumstances, I strongly question whether Congress should again be moving legislation that may ultimately lead to increases in the Postal Service's overhead. As amended, H.R. 828 would require agencies to perform searches of public records on current employees as well as on potential hires to determine their tax compliance. Given that the Postal Service employs nearly 600,000 employees nationwide, many of whom serve in a temporary capacity and exhibit high turnover like relief carriers, the bill could substantially add to the Postal Service's administrative costs by requiring them to review lien notices which are often filed at the county level. The bill could also increase their cost per hire as well as adversely affect the length of time it takes to bring new hires on board. I certainly don't think that in the intent of the gentleman from Utah 
That is the intent of the gentleman in offering this bill. Lastly, since the bulk of the Postal Service's employee appointees practices are governed under Title 39 versus Title 5, and its workers' disciplinary policies are subjected to collective bargaining agreements, I am not convinced that applying the provisions of this particular bill to the Postal Service and the PRC makes the best policy sense. As I understand, the Committee may be considering some form of postal reform later this year, so perhaps it makes more sense to address the issue of postal employee tax compliance at that point. I would hope that my colleagues from both sides of the aisle will join me in support of this amendment, and I yield back the balance of my time. I thank the gentleman. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from Utah and asks, would the gentleman yield? Yes. Uh, briefly, because I won't need much time, I would generally agree with many of the things the gentleman, uh, Mr. Davis, just said. However, I would note in Representative Spears' amendment, uh, she uh, specifically reminds us that the Office of Government Ethics uh, requires all Federal employees, and that does apply to the Post Office. Yield back. Thank you. I, I oppose uh, this amendment. Uh, Postal Service employees should leave, live up to the same uh, high obligations and duties uh, as other Federal workers. Uh, they happen to have a higher delinquency rate than the rest uh, of the Federal Government uh, employees. There is some, something like $283 million in taxes owed to the Federal Government that have not been collected by these employees at date, to date. Um, and so I would, uh, I would oppose this amendment. Yield back. Yield back. Uh, anyone else? Good. The question is, sorry for that Mr. Chairman, remark. Mr. Yes, Chairman, the ranking members. I want to yield to Mr. Davis in, in, in case he has a response. Yes. Uh, the gentleman from Maryland is recognized for five minutes. The gentleman is recognized. Thank you, very much, sir. thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank the ranking member for yielding to me. I agree that certainly postal employees, as well as any and all should and must live up to the highest standards. But from a technical vantage point, postal employees are not really Federal employees. Uh, the Postal Service is indeed not a solid Federal agency. It is a pseudo-Federal agency. Many of these employees are governed under contract agreements as a result of collective bargaining and those agreements do not enter into discussions or definitions relative to this kind of discipline or tax liability. And so I don't know if technically they actually fall under the purvey of the legislation that we are considering. So I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and yield back. Reclaiming my time. I, Mr. Chairman, I support this amendment uh, offered by the gentleman from Illinois. This this committee has held numerous hearings to consider the financial challenges faced by the Postal Service. As a matter of fact, we just had a hearing last week. The Postal Service is expected to act as an independent business and does not pay its employees with U.S. tax dollars. Nonetheless, the majority would subject the Postal Service to the bill's requirement, including requiring the Post Office to conduct ongoing searches of public records in potentially hundreds of State and local jurisdictions to determine if a tax lien has been filed against any one of the Post Office's hundreds of thousands of employees. We need to keep in mind, too, that the Post Office just told us last week that they have let go um, 100,000 people in the last few years, three years. Uh, until we know what the potential costs of this legislation's requirements may be, we should not impose further burdens on the Postal Service, and I encourage members to support the amendment. With that, I yield back. I thank the gentleman. The question is, on agreeing to the amendment offered by the gentleman from Illinois, all those in favor say aye. Those opposed say no. In the opinion of the chairs, the noes have it. The noes have it. Uh, the, uh, we, now, we now move to the last second. Okay, okay, yeah. I move that the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform report H.R. 828 to the House with the recommendation the bill do pass as amended. The question is on favorably reporting H.R. 828 to the House. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed, no. no. 
In the opinion of the chairs, the ayes have it. The ayes have it. And it will report. And go right to the point. Thank you for letting me skip that page. The ayes have it, and the motion is agreed to. H.R. 828 is ordered reported to the House of Representatives. I ask unanimous consent that the staff be authorized to make necessary and conforming technical changes to the bill. Without objection, the motion uh, and unanimous consent are agreed to. The committee will now consider H.R. 1470, a bill to extend the probationary period for Federal employees. The Chair now recognizes himself. Last month, OPM Director Berry discussed the need for consistent organizational commitment uh, to get rid of poor performers uh, and, failing, and failing performers. He noted that, uh, that in fact, this, this was a pervasive problem, and I couldn't agree with him more. The bill before the committee today allows individuals the opportunity to complete job-related training and demonstrate their capabilities for the position to which they have been hired. At the same time, the bill provides the government a way to quickly and easily correct instances where the hiring process doesn't result in a good match. I commend the subcommittee chairman, Mr. Ross, for introducing this bill to reform uh, the uh, hiring practices. I recognize that those who are hired would like certainty from the day of their offer. However, making sure that we get it right is in the long run in the best interest of the government and in the best interest of the individual who has been hired to ensure that, in fact, he, will have a long, he or she will have a long and successful career. With that, I recognize the ranking member for his opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, currently, Federal employees serve a one-year probationary period when they are hired into Federal service or promoted to a managerial or supervisory position. According to the Merit Systems Protection Board, the purpose of this probationary period is to provide the government with an opportunity to evaluate an individual's conduct and performance on the job to determine if an appointment to the civil service should become final. Let me be clear, it is appropriate that the Federal government, as an employer, has a reasonable opportunity to evaluate the ability of, a, of new hires and newly promoted employees to carry out the work for which they were hired. That said, one year is a, a fully adequate period in which to assess an employee's ability to perform. And even the one-year probationary period uh, seems to far exceed the probationary periods that most private sector employees must serve. Mr. Chairman, this committee has not held a single hearing to identify any shortcomings in the current probation period. Uh, we do not have a single piece of testimony or evidence from any agency explaining why a two-year probationary period is needed or how it would improve the efficiency of the Federal workforce. And yet, here we are considering the legislation that would erode protections guaranteed to Federal employees without identifying any benefit this would produce. Put simply, probationers can be fired without cause. The MSPB has explained that the primary reason non-probationary employees are granted due process protections against adverse actions is to keep the civil service free from prohibited personnel practices, such as wrongful termination or other such practices. Mr. Chairman, I know that you have an interest in protecting whistleblowers who alert us to wrongdoing within a government agency. Weakening the due process protections available for whistleblowers will only make Federal employees less willing to report fraud or abuse. <clears throat> it is our interest as the main oversight body in the Congress to support protections for Federal workers that allow them to effectively and efficiently carry out their duties without fear of arbitrary personnel actions or retaliation. Current law provides ample time for managers to evaluate new employees, and I cannot support in an effort to extend the time during which employees serving our Federal Government are not offered basic protections under the law. For those reasons, I urge my colleagues to vote against the bill. With that, I yield back. I thank the gentleman. 
I will hold the record open to the end of the day for members who want to submit written opening statements. I would now ask unanimous consent that the letter received by all members of the committee from Government Managers Coalition be entered into the record without objection so ordered. We will now open the bill, H.R. 1470, for consideration. Without objection, H.R. 1470 will be considered as read and open for amendment at any point. The text has already been distributed and is in each of your folders. The clerk will designate the bill. H.R. 1470, a bill to amend Title V, United States Code, to extend the probationary period applicable to appointments in the civil service and for other purposes. The gentleman from Florida has an amendment in the nature of substitute. The amendment has been distributed. Without objection, the amendment will be considered as read and original text for purposes of amendment. Mr. Ross will be recognized for five minutes to explain his amendment in the form of substitute. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for allowing me the opportunity to present uh, House Resolution 1470. I, like uh, Ranking Member Cummings and Mr. Connolly, agree that, that, that public service is a noble calling and it is an honor to be a Federal employee. H.R. 1470 and the substitute amendment lengthens the required probationary period for Federal civilian employees. The probationary period is currently set by regulation. The purpose of the probationary period is to provide the government with an opportunity to evaluate an employee's conduct and performance on the job to determine if an appointment should become final. Uh, this bill establishes a minimum two-year probationary period for the civil service. Agencies have discretion to lengthen the probationary period for a reasonable fixed duration, provided such probationary periods are uniformly applied by occupation. The bill does not change the terms of termi for termination by of, of probationers. Agencies proposing to terminate a probationer because their work performs because their work performance or conduct fails to demonstrate their fitness or qualifications for continued employment shall continue to provide a written explanation for the termination. To encourage regular dialogue between employees and their supervisors, the bill requires probationers receive information on performance requirements. Probationers may continue to appeal terminations they believe were for partisan political reasons, marital status, or improper procedure. The amendment further uh, clarifies that the veterans' preferences shall be imposed by keeping the length of probationary period the same for veterans. Uh, it also confirms that the extension of the probationary period applies, on, applies only to new hires. And I yield back. Sure. Thank you. Uh, I am prepared to open this for amendments. Does the Ranking Member have an amendment? I have a statement. Uh, on the, uh, on the, he has an amendment, right? He, both of you, I think, have an amendment. Yeah, I thought he, I want to respond to what he just said. Oh, the gentleman is recognized for five minutes. While the amendment offered by Mr. Ross eliminates some of the potentially absurd consequences of the original bill, it does nothing to address the underlying issue, which is what we have no evidence of the need to prolong the probationary period for competitive service Federal employees. Federal employees care for our veterans, research and fight diseases such as cancer, respond to natural disasters, ensure that the food we eat is safe and protect our borders. Federal employees are the minds and hands responsible for delivering government services to our nation's citizens. As written, H.R. 1470 would have subjected these Federal employees to a two-year probationary period when they were hired and would then have subjected the employees to another two-year probationary period every time they are promoted, transferred, demoted or reassigned. Under the provisions of the original bill, an individual newly hired by the Border Patrol would have served a two-year probationary period. If that individual was then transferred every two years, say, to Tucson and then to El Paso, to San Diego, the agent would have been on probation for eight years of his career. If the agent performed well and was promoted to a supervisory position, the agent would have been placed on probation for another two years. If the agent was then transferred after completing the initial supervisory uh, probationary period, he or she would have begun another two-year probationary period. As a result of this legislation, the employee would quite literally have been on probation his or her entire career. One of the many potential negative effects of this system could be to impede the effectiveness of our national security and law enforcement agencies. Federal employees guarding our borders or serving in the FBI or filling other Homeland Security functions could be reluctant to accept reassignments or transfers that would result in further probation, even if such a transfer was in the best interest of our national security. I appreciate uh, that Representative Ross's amendment eliminates 
the possibility that Federal employees might spend decades on probation, but the manner in which this legislation was drafted suggests a profound lack of consideration of the impact of the policy change this legislation seeks. This reflects the fact that the Committee has not held a hearing on or conducted any other type of assessment to determine whether any lengthening of the current probationary period is needed or would even be an improvement over the current practice. Instead of presenting a thoughtfully uh, constructed uh, tool for government managers, this bill appears uh, instead to be another example of the majority's campaign to reduce the rights of Federal employees in another chapter in an ongoing misguided effort to denigrate public service. For that reason, I strongly oppose 1470 and the amendment in the nature of a substitute. The chair I yield back. Thank you. The Chair recognizes himself, and I yield to Mr. Ross. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and I appreciate the Ranking Member pointing out those, the original problems with the bill, and we were able to correct that, and I think that makes it a very good bill. Not only that, but when we look at um, the fact that the Government Managers Coalition indicates that if managers miss the one-year window to dismiss a failing employee, the burden of proof becomes much greater if they decide to do so later. For that reason, the managers, the Federal managers, have an incentive to dismiss the employer prior to the expiration of the one-year window, even though the employee has not had sufficient time to show they could master the job. It gives that tool that Chairman or that, that um, uh, Mr. Berry from the OPM testified that they need more flexibility. They need more time to evaluate these employees. Let's look at the benefits authorizer for Social Security. They are in a training period for eight and a half months, after which then they have to be on the job to apply the training they have. One year is not sufficient time. Furthermore, you have probably one of the best jobs in being a Federal employee. You have got attrition rates as a Federal employee of one and a half percent annually. You have got 1.2 percent for postal employees. It is a coveted position. We want to make sure that those that are working for the Federal Government, in whatever capacity, have the ability to perform their jobs, and more importantly, that we have the managers that are empowered with the tools necessary to make the decisions if they want to keep them or not, but do so with adequate on-the-job training. I yield back. Reclaiming my time. Uh, I agree with the gentleman that we have been told by the administration and supported by the Government Managers Coalition that this flexibility for more time, this ability to be insure, ensured that the fit uh, works. I am sensitive to the Ranking Member's statement that someone could be transferred from time to time to time, but as the Ranking Member knows, uh, once you complete your two years, the only risk you would have would be that you were not able to continue in a promotion or a job transfer for which the Peter principle potentially applied. Uh, ultimately, in the real world, you do not have the protections that we have in the Federal workforce. In the real world, if you get promoted to your level of incompetency, you then get fired. In this case, if you get promoted to a level for which you cannot do the job, you only end up back where you were you still retain your fundamental uh, rights to reclaim your underlying job. So I do believe that the gentleman has corrected uh, those areas that were most in, uh, in need. And at this time, I, my intention is to open this for amendment in case there are additional amendments that would make this good bill more perfect. With that, the bill is open for amendments. Mr. Chairman. I don't have an amendment, but I move to strike the last word to speak in opposition. To Would you be willing to do it on one of the amendments in the sake of time? We are under Mr. Ross's. Okay. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Thank you. You know, prior to the uh, Pendleton Civil Service Reform Act of 1883, Federal Government jobs were part of the spoil system, and the selection supported the party in power. Under the Civil Service, Federal employees are chosen and promoted based on merit. Some senior positions are filled by political appointment, but the vast majority of the Federal workforce is appointed under the competitive service. Those Federal workers are provided protections against discrimination as well as targeting by political appointees. The separation of politics from the business of government is a bedrock principle and ensures that our Federal workforce is free from undue influence and prejudice. Over the years, some have made attempts to erode this principle and weaken the protections that safeguard our important and valuable civil servants. Yes, important and valuable. 
And I know that some members of Congress like to disparage Federal workers to score political points, and many believe that the Federal Government begins and ends with elected officials. Uh, but I am talking about dedicated public servants who have devoted their careers, skills, talents, and efforts to serving their fellow citizens, the ones who make this government and in many ways this country uh, work. Federal agency managers should have an appropriate period of time in which to evaluate their new hires. If that period ends without incident or cause, the employee should may be made permanent and enjoy the protections of the civil service. Uh, if a Federal manager cannot properly evaluate a new em employee in 365 days, agencies should re retrain their managers, not double the probationary time. Uh, as members of Congress, we accept that our jobs come with a specific probationary period, one that comes up for review every two years. But the Federal Civil Service is very different and should be treated differently. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I am opposed to this bill as well as the, the amendment, and I urge all of my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to vote against it. Would the gentleman yield? Yes. Uh, just one question. I, I noted in your, your statement about the managers need to evaluate within 365 days. Yes. In the case of a training program that went on for, let's say, 13 months, mm -hmm. wouldn't the, uh, the probation expire while you were just finding out whether the person was a good student rather than whether they were able to do the job? Well, I, I, I don't know if, if, if we are going to split hairs about 13 months or 12 months, Mr. Chair, but I do know this is that you know, when you, uh, when you set a, 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 a evaluation and somebody gets promoted, well, you shouldn't be allowed to, to put them back into a one-year probationary period, should you? Should you? I think under current law, they actually are probationary in their promotion. So that's a catch-22 then. You just keep putting them into probationary period, even if they excel in their position, and then they, they could go through their entire career without getting No, no actually, under Mr. Ross's substitute, he fixed that. Oh, he fixes that. Yes. What he, what he can't it fix be, is that if you go through a year of training or nearly a year, the manager who sees you for the first time might see you after the probation is over. There are programs that often go much or even a full year. So one of the challenges is, under current law, that that training time, finding out that you are a good student, is part of your probationary period. And some, you know, some people are really good students and not so good at doing the job. Some people are not so good students but good at doing the job. This gives an opportunity to look at both. And, and of course, OPM allows that, uh, uh, provides for regulations and rules that already do what Mr. Ross is claiming to do in his legislation. Uh, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Uh, can we go to the amendments or? No, well, I've got a yes and a no. A gentleman from Illinois is recognized. Thank you, Chairman. Chairman, and I don't intend to be redundant. As a matter of fact, let me just uh, indicate that my sentiments have been expressed by the ranking member, Mr. Cummins and Mr. Clay. And I do believe that a year. I, I mean, probation for many individuals when they get a new job is a period where they are not only proving themselves to the employer, but they are also proving themselves to themselves. And the relief that many of these individuals feel once they have completed the probationary period is something um, that they are very joyful about. They know that they have now made it. They are considered a regular employee with all of the benefits and rights and privileges that one should have. And so I think that expanding this beyond a year is a bit of overkill. I, mean, I agree with all of those who believe that you should get a day's work for a day's pay. 
that you ought to be competent in what you do. But I don't think that promoting fear and holding individuals up for two whole years, I, I think that is overkill. So I agree with uh, Mr. Cummins and Mr. Clay, and I oppose this amendment and I oppose the, the bill. The gentleman yields back. Uh, the gentleman from Virginia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report. Mr. Chairman, I, I would like to speak on the, on the bill in principle. <clears throat> I would like to speak on Mr. Ross's bill. Does, does the, does the gentleman withdraw his amendment at this time? I would be glad to, to yield to my colleague from Massachusetts. Okay. The gentleman withdraws his amendment. The gentleman from Massachusetts is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I won't need five minutes. I do want to point out that a year should be plenty of time. A year should be plenty of time. If, if a manager is engaged in watching that employee, uh, you know, I think about what goes on in our own offices, you know within a month whether that person is going to, going to be able to handle the job. You are looking for a, 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 a basic level of commitment and, and energy and attitude uh, towards doing that job, generally you can, you can see within the first month whether that person is going to make it or not. Here we have a, a year-long process. Uh, I, I want to point out that, as the Chairman has pointed out and, and uh, as the Ranking Member has pointed out in previous hearings, that uh, oftentimes uh, in, in these government agencies, the managers are not, uh, are not sufficiently evaluating and have not been trained to sufficiently evaluate employees. And that is where the weakness is here. Sometimes they get promoted you know, to different levels without sufficient evaluation. And by making it two years isn't going to mean that that person is going to get fully evaluated. If it is the same manager, they will just kick the can down the road for two years. And I just think it denies an opportunity. We are trying to attract good people into government. And I think that uh, you know, the public employee bashing that we see going on uh, in the media and elsewhere and in, in, in this body uh, you know, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a barrier to getting good people to consider public employment as a noble profession, as a, something they should, should commit to. And I think that this two-year probationary period is far too long, and uh, it will diminish our ability to attract the very people that we want in here. Would the gentleman and, yield? Uh, of course I yield. Uh, just real quickly, do you think that one year would be sufficient for IRS employees? For IRS employees? Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, for, for a follow-up, uh, currently the IRS employees have a three-year probationary period. Well, you know, obviously they have adopted different standards. But I think if, you know, especially the IRS, of course they have a lot of different disciplines. Reclaiming my time, there are a lot of disciplines uh, within the IRS that might warrant them to, to use a, a three-year uh, period. Uh, some jobs there are, are extremely uh, highly, highly, highly technical and they came in at a very high uh, level of education, obviously. But uh, uh, certainly I think, if, uh, look, you're not, in, in many cases you're not looking at, um, you know, whether this person can be a nuclear physicist in a, in a nuclear program. You are looking whether or not this person coming into the agency has the basic level of, uh, of competency, commitment and attitude to do the job. And if you apply yourself as a manager and review that employee's attitude and their commitment and, and their ability, uh, then you should be able to make that decision in one year. And I, I don't think that, uh, you know, look, uh, someone applies, uh, you know, to be the janitor down at uh, the uh, Bureau of Printing and Engraving, uh, you, you ought to know within the first month whether that person can do the job. Will the gentleman yield? Of course I will yield. I would like to uh, compliment the gentleman on his statement and, and uh, support his statement and just add that uh, I very much view uh, public service as a, a very noble profession uh, when it is done well and done honestly and with great commitment. Regrettably, there seems to be a great deal of uh, public employee union bashing that is taking place in our country today, and this uh, bill seems the same to me. I mean, I, I can tell in a day, I can tell in a month, uh, to have a, a, an additional year on probation 
is a standard that certainly is not in the private sector, not in any other public sector around the world or anywhere. And I would say that those that are critical of uh, public employees are the same ones that were critical of the child labor laws, that were critical of the safety and standard laws, that were critical of the many of steps that we took uh, to protect uh, public employees and other workers in our country. So I want to com compliment the gentleman and yield back. Thank the you. I just have 20 seconds, 20, 24 seconds left. Uh, let, me just, let me just say that, uh, look, I, I think it is incumbent on us as members of Congress to try to appeal to the best nature of the people that we represent and not the basest or, or, or most uh, damaging or, or most negative aspects of society out there. And I think that we should try to elevate and promote uh, the ideals of public service uh, to our constituents and to the country. I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman from Virginia is re-recognized to offer his amendment. I thank the chairman. Um, and, and let me key off on the, the, uh, the clerk will report. Uh, amendment in the nature of a substitute Mr. to chairman. H.R. 1470 Mr. offered by Mr. Connolly of Virginia. Chairman. I would ask the further reading of the amendment be dispensed. Uh, the gentleman. Could I reserve a point of order on this? The gentleman reserves a point of order. Uh, the gentleman is recognized to explain his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, I want to key off on a point that our colleague, Mr. Lynch, just made that really may be part of the, I, I think, the underlying goal of dealing with uh, problem employees and making sure that the employees that uh, remain are productive and efficient, committed, uh, is a noble goal. Uh, it is a perfectly sensible management goal. But I think Mr. Lynch put his finger on it that more often than not, the problem isn't the probationary period of time. It is, in fact, the training of the managers themselves. In fact, we have a letter that was distributed to, uh, to, uh, to us today, addressed to you, Mr. Chairman, and, and the members of the committee from the Federal Managers Association. I want to read part of it. Uh, it says, the Merit Systems Protection Board has found that few managers receive training on how to use the probationary period in initial employee assessments. Untrained managers are more likely to quickly let an employee go before giving them a valid assessment or to allow a mediocre employee to advance past the probationary period in the hope that that employer will eventually improve. Requiring supervisor training on the use of the probationary period as an assessment tool would greatly increase the effectiveness of the proposed legislation. We strongly urge the committee to consider legislation introduced by Congressman Jim Moran to this end, H.R. 5522, in this Congress. Now, that bill was introduced by Congressman Moran, Congressman Wolf, and myself on a bipartisan basis because we think uh, that that supervisor training would, frankly, better address the underlying issue that Mr. Ross is getting at, which is a, a, a worthy is issue. Um, and so what my amendment does is to substitute the Federal Supervisor Training Act, uh, a bipartisan bill, uh, for the bill in front of us. Uh, OPM Director John Berry said just last week, we know we can fire poor performers, it is just that managers aren't doing it. The Director of the Federal Managers Association explained how to fix that problem. The general schedule provides avenues for managers to deny step increases and terminate poor performing employees, but managers must know these avenues exist to utilize them. This amendment simply would help fire underperforming employees, not just in their first year, but throughout their career. It would get at the heart of the problem which is a need to do a better job training managers. And I would hope Mr. Ross would accept this as a friendly amendment. I think it could serve as a bridge between the two sides in terms of the concerns that have been expressed. Would the gentleman uh, yield? I certainly would. Uh, is the gentleman asking us to repass the Workforce Flexibility Act of 2004? No, I am asking that we actually pass the Federal Supervisor Training Act that was introduced earlier. Oh, well. Uh, in, and I, in this Congress. I appreciate that. Does the gentleman still uh, reserve his point of order? Uh, yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Would the gentleman please state his, uh, his point of order? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I object to the amendment because it is not germane to the bill. House Rule 16, Clause 7 requires amendments to be on the same subject as the bill under consideration. The gentleman's amendment is not on the same subject as the bill under consideration and is therefore not germane. I thank the gentleman. I thank the gentleman. I am prepared to rule. Could I, could I ask a question of the Chair before he rules? I would yield for a question. Given the fact that uh, this is an amendment in the nature of a substitute, would the uh, point of order still stand? Yes. H.R. 1470 
extends the probationary period for newly hired Federal employees. The gentleman's amendment would strike the underlying bill and replace it with new requirements on agencies to provide management training. Management training is a different subject matter than probationary periods. As such, the amendment is not germane and is not ordered. The Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Maryland for an amendment. Mr. Chairman, uh, I have a, an amendment that you desk. The clerk will Amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 1470 offered by Mr. Cummings of Maryland. Strike. That's unanimous consent that the amendment be considered as read. So ordered. The gentleman is recognized to explain his Thank amendment. you very much, Mr. Chairman. The legislation before us proposes at least a double to the probationary period applied to new hires in the civil service or to those promoted within the service. In fact, as written, the bill requires a probationary period of at least two years with no mandatory upper limit. So theoretically, enactment of this bill would allow an agency to establish an indefinite probationary period. In essence, however, the bill seems intended to double the period during which Federal employees lack the due process protections of the civil service after they are hired or promoted. We are considering this change without having held a hearing in the committee to examine whether such a change is needed or what the impact of a change in the probationary period would be. And without a shred of evidence explaining whether or how such a change would improve the efficiency or effectiveness of our workforce, I strongly oppose this rush to an uninformed judgment. For that reason, I am offering an amendment in the nature of a substitute that would require the GAO to conduct a thorough assessment of the current probationary period applied to Federal employees to determine whether existing regulations and procedures provide sufficient time to enable a Federal agency to assess whether a new hire or recently promoted employee should be retained in that position. This amendment uh, would require the GAO to submit its finding with findings within six months of the date of enactment in a written report provided to this committee and to the Senate Committee on Homeland Security and Government Affairs. If we are truly concerned about putting in place the probationary period that best serves the needs of the Federal Government, we need to study the current experience to determine what, what is and what is not working and what changes are, are, um, are, are, are not needed. And with further and with such data, uh, we can craft and form legislation that will accomplish what should be our uh, shared priority of ensuring that we have a pl in place a fully trained workforce capable of effectively implementing government programs. I urge that we adopt this amendment and move swiftly to pass it through the House and Senate to the GAO uh, so that the GAO may initiate uh, the study. And just going back to something that was said a little bit earlier, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, and consistent with this amendment, uh, we realize that OPM has the authority uh, right now under uh, 5 U.S.C. 3321 uh, to set by regulation a longer probationary period for competitive service positions. I think it was Mr. Ross just a moment ago that mentioned that the Internal Revenue Service under that authority already uh, can extend that period. We also have the National Institute of Standards and Technology, U.S. Department of Agriculture, DOD Lab uh, Demonstration Program, Department of Commerce. And so I wonder uh, whether this bill is necessary in that the regulations uh, already give uh, authority when it, it is necessary. And so with that, Mr. Uh, uh, Chairman, I yield back. I, I thank the gentleman. I would note for the record that the IRS three-year period is codified in code and not by discretion, and would ask unanimous consent that the GAO report of June 29, 2005 uh, be entered in the record on subject. Without objection, so ordered. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Gosar, for five minutes. Yes, um, you know, I am from a right-to-work state, and with the unemployment rate as of March 2011 being at 9.2 percent, my state and more specifically my district, which has unemployment rates in certain regions up, upwards to 75 percent, would be more than willing to accept a Federal job that has total compensation on the average of $101,000 in exchange for a two-year probationary period. I would actually like to see us have a total probationary period 
like we have in our state, so that we have a better work ethic all the way across the board. I yield back my time. The gentleman, uh, would the gentleman yield to the former chairman? Yes, I would. Yeah. You know, I think that the GAO study is definitely in order, you know, um, as um, the uh, ranking member mentioned, you know, because I'm not clear that if I'm working in New York and I'm transferred to Boston, you know, what happens with the probation period? Uh, do I have to go now through another probation period? And then after they transfer me from Boston uh, to Arizona, will I have to go through another probationary period? This is not clear to me. So, and I think that um, we need to have these kind of questions answered, and we're dealing with lives. So, um, uh, based on that, would you support the GAO study that was recommended by the ranking member? I would actually look at extending, like for Arizona, the right to work. Um, because what we ought to have is, just like everybody else across America, is, is based upon at will. Let me get, say this then. You know, if I have been working for 10 years on the job, say in New York, now I am transferred to um, Arizona, and I have to now go back through a probationary period? Well, no. Doesn't that continue? Doesn't right. that continue with? Would you yield to, the, to Mr. Ross? Yes, I will. Mr. Ross? Thank you for yielding. Uh, it is a two-year probationary period. If you start your uh, date of employment on September 1st, uh, it goes for two years from that particular day, no matter whether you are geographically transferred somewhere else within this country. So it is a two-year probationary period. It does not restart itself. It continues for two years, after which then you would have uh, full permanent employment with the Federal Government. Is there any, would the gentleman yield again? Is there any ethical reason for this kind of change? In, um, um, if, I, if I might respond, uh, one of the things that we discussed, and I think that was brought, brought rather evident in, in our previous hearings, is that we want to make sure that we recruit, retain, and reward good Federal employees. As is evidenced by the letter that we received from the governor, Government Managers Coalition, uh, this empowers them with another tool to make sure that they are getting the best uh, human resource out there to work for the Federal Government. If we are speaking of, of, of ethics, I think it is it's it's an even more necessary tool to make sure that ethically these Government managers are doing the best job they possibly can in making sure that we recruit, retain, and reward the best workers out there. Would the gentleman yield further? Yes, sir. Would you be in favor of a GAO report to make certain that we are doing the right kinds of things rather than just um, uh, picking up a number and just sort of walking around and, and, and espousing it? Well, there, if, if I might, there has been a GAO report. In fact, there has been a report done by the Merit Systems Protection Board, uh, actually two of them, one in 05 and one in 06, which evidenced that uh, uh, it examined how the agencies were using probationary period to ensure only the best candidates received finalized uh, appointments. Um, it indicated that the supervisors wanted greater flexibility to determine the length of probationary period, particularly for supervisors who were trainees. Uh, you know, it also indicated that flexibility in training the length of a probationary period based upon the unique characteristics of a position was necessary. So, in essence, to empower now the GAO to do this again is nothing more than kicking this can down the road when I think we have significant evidence before us, significant testimony before us that says this is a tool that managers want to make sure we are getting the best and the brightest workforce. Gentleman, yield back. Yes, sir. The question is on agreeing to the amendment offered by the gentleman from Mer Really. I thank the Chairman. Um, I just want to make sure that we are all talking about the same thing, because my understanding from reading the uh, code sections that apply to Internal Revenue Service employees is that the three-year probationary period is limited to a specific class of IRS employee, which are the special agents, and that the standard probationary period under the Internal Revenue Service uh, personnel requirements is a one-year period. And I am reading specifically from uh, 6.315.1.1.1, which says IRS special agents selected from an OPM or DEU certificate must serve a three-year probationary period. And this is where the heart of this matter comes down. Those agents have a specialized level of training equivalent to somebody who goes to a professional school. And that is why that certification and probationary period is necessary. But as somebody who advised a lot of private businesses and human resources policies, 
I think it is absurd to impose a two-year probationary period. Most private employers that I worked with had a 90-day or a 60 or a six-month probationary period because if you are not capable of determining the performance abilities of an employee within that period of time, you are making a huge mistake in retaining them on your payroll. So this is really just a misguided attempt to try to impose more flexibility to take adverse action against an employee who has already demonstrated fitness for their job. And it, it seems to me an incredible overreach to ex extend probationary periods when the purpose of probation is for an employer to be able to determine whether that employee has the fundamental skills to perform the duties of that job. And if they can't do that in six months or a year, then those managers are woefully inadequate in their job. And that's why I will oppose this, op this uh, effort. I thank the gentleman. The question is on agreeing to the amendment offered by the gentleman from Maryland. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed say no. In the opinion of the uh, Chair, the noes, noes have it. A roll, a roll call vote is requested. Okay. The Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Issa? No. Mr. Issa votes no. Mr. Burton? No. Mr. Burton votes no. Mr. Micah? Mr. Platts? No. Mr. Platts votes no. Mr. Turner? Mr. McHenry? Mr. Jordan? Mr. Chaffetz? Mr. Chaffetz votes no. Mr. Mack, Mr. Wahlberg, Mr. Lankford, Mr. Amash, no. Mr. Amash votes no. Ms. Burkle, Mr. Ms. Burkle votes no. Dr. Gosar, no. Dr. Gosar votes no. Mr. Labrador, Mr. Meehan, no. Dr. Desjarlais, no. Dr. Desjarlais votes no. Mr. Walsh, Mr. Gowdy, no, ma'am. Mr. Gowdy votes no. Mr. Ross. No. Mr. Ross votes no. Mr. Ginta? Mr. Farenthold? No. Mr. Farenthold votes no. Mr. Kelly? Mr. Cummings? Yes. Mr. Cummings votes aye. Mr. Towns? Aye. Mr. Towns votes aye. Mrs. Maloney? Ms. Norton? Aye. Ms. Norton votes aye. Mr. Kucinich? Aye. Mr. Kucinich votes aye. Mr. Tierney? Aye. Mr. Tierney votes aye. Mr. Clay? Mr. Clay votes aye. Mr. Lynch? Aye. Mr. Lynch votes aye. Mr. Cooper? Mr. Connolly? Aye. Mr. Connolly votes aye. Mr. Quigley? Mr. Davis? Aye. Mr. Davis votes aye. Mr. Braley? Aye. Mr. Braley votes aye. Mr. Welch? Mr. Yarmouth? Aye. Mr. Murphy? Aye. Mr. Murphy votes aye. Ms. Spear? Aye. Ms. Spear votes aye. Aye. You are not, ma'am. Ms. Maloney votes aye. Mr. Labrador, you're not recorded. Mr. Labrador votes no. Mr. Meehan votes no. The clerk will report. Mr. Wahlberg, I don't have you recorded. <laughs> you, you Mr. Wahlberg votes no. Hmm? You were losing anyway. Yeah, but... Okay, report, please. On that vote, Mr. Chairman, there's 14 no's, 13 ayes. The amendment is not agreed to. <laughs> if there's no further discussion, I move the committee. Uh, on oversight and government reform, report H.R. 14. I'm sorry. 
If there is no further discussion, the question is on the amendment in nature of a substitute offered from the, by the gentleman from Florida. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Those opposed? In the opinion of the chairs, the ayes have it. The ayes have it. If there is no further discussion, I move that the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform report H.R. 1470 to the House with recommendation that that bill do pass as amended. The question is on favorably reporting H.R. 1470 to the House. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Issa? Aye. Mr. Issa votes aye. Mr. Burton? Aye. Mr. Burton votes aye. Mr. Micah? Mr. Platts? Mr. Turner? Mr. McHenry? Mr. Jordan? Mr. Chaffetz? Mr. Chaffetz votes aye. Mr. Mack? Mr. Wahlberg? Mr. Wahlberg votes aye. Mr. Langford? Mr. Amash? Mr. Amash votes aye. Ms. Burkle? Ms. Burkle votes aye. Dr. Gosar? Dr. Gosar votes aye. Mr. Labrador? Mr. Labrador votes aye. Mr. Meehan? Mr. Meehan votes aye. Dr. Desjardins? Aye. Dr. Desjardins votes aye. Mr. Walsh? Mr. Gowdy? Aye. Mr. Gowdy votes aye. Mr. Ma Ross? Mr. Ross votes aye. Mr. Ginta? Aye. Mr. Ginta votes aye. Mr. Farenthold? Aye. Mr. Farenthold votes aye. Mr. Kelly? Mr. Cummings? Mr. Cummings votes no. Mr. Towns? Mr. Towns votes no. Ms. Maloney? Mr. Uh, Ms. Maloney votes no. Ms. Norton? Ms. Norton votes no. Mr. Kucinich? Mr. Kucinich votes no. Mr. Tierney? No. Mr. Tierney votes no. Mr. Clay? No. Mr. Clay votes no. Mr. Lynch? No. Mr. Lynch votes no. Mr. Cooper? Mr. Connolly? No. Mr. Connolly votes no. Mr. Quigley? Mr. Davis? No. Mr. Davis votes no. Mr. Braley? No. Mr. Braley votes no. Mr. Welch? Mr. Yarmouth? Mr. Murphy? Yeah. Mr. Ver Murphy votes no. Ms. Speer? Yeah. Ms. Speer votes no. I thought Chaffetz walked in. I mean, uh, Mr. McHenry? Mr. McHenry, I don't have you recorded. Aye. Mr. V McHenry votes aye. Patrick, I was just recognizing you came in the room. Mr. Platts? Mr. Platts? Mr. Platts, I don't have you recorded. No? The clerk will report the tally. On that vote, 15 ayes, 14 noes. The ayes have it and the motion is agreed to. H.R. 1470 is ordered reported to the House of Representatives. I ask unanimous consent that the staff be authorized to make necessary and conforming technical changes to the bill. Without objection. Mr. Turner, do you have a statement for the record? Mr. Chairman, if I had been present, I would have voted yes. The gentleman would, re would like to be reported as yes. Does not change the outcome of the vote. Without objection, the motion uh, to amend and include is unanimously accepted. Uh, Mr. Walsh do, you, Walsh, do you want to be reported by unanimous consent? Yes, Mr. Chairman, I would be a yes. Without objection, so ordered. We will all stay tuned. The committee will now consider the following bill, H.R. 1423, introduced by the Congressman Tom Cole of Oklahoma, which designates a facility at the United States Post Office Service at 115 
4th Street Avenue Southwest in Ar Artemore, Oklahoma, as the Specialist Michael E. Phelps Post Office. Army Specialist Michael Phelps was tragically killed February 24, 2008, in Iraq, Phillips, when his vehicle, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, was hit by an improvised explosive device. Specialist Phillips was assigned to the 101st Airborne Division and was only 19 years old when he passed away. On behalf of the committee, I thank Specialist Phillips for his brave and courageous service to our country and offer our condolences to his family and would also ask all members to join with me in reporting this bill favorably. Mr. Chairman. The Chair recognizes the former Chairman of the Committee, Mr. Towns, for five minutes. I echo your comments on H.R. 1423. As the bill seeks to designate the Fourth Avenue Post Office in Ardmore, Oklahoma, after Specialist Michael E. Phillips, who died at the young age of 19 on February 24, 2008, while serving our country honorably in Iraq. Having met all the committee's requisite criteria, I support the passage of H.R. 1423 and urge my colleagues to do the same. I yield back the balance of my time. Uh, thank you, and I will hold the record open for uh, till the end of the day. And would note that the gentlelady who worked on this bill, it is her birthday, so so we'll move on. I would ask unanimous consent that this bill be uh, reported favorably, without objection. So ordered. The committee stands adjourned. You know, you, you, you caught the adjournment. <laughs>